right, everyone, uh, let's start. We've got uh, a, a long and important board meeting. So opening the board, uh, the Montpelier Roxbury Board of School Directors at uh, 631. Um, we have a heavy decision tonight. Uh, I'm just gonna say it's been weighing on, on both communities. It's been weighing on all the board members. Um, the none of the choices are choices that we like. All of the choices are are very hard and very difficult. Um, I want to give thanks to all the board members who have put in a lot of thought and a lot of work and probably lost a lot of sleep and neglected loved ones and their day jobs and other things over the last few weeks. Uh, giving this thought, I know everyone is 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 struggling with a tough decision. And uh, again, no one, no one likes the choices before us. I also want to thank the community for uh, an incredible amount of input, uh, almost all of which has been very thoughtful and respectful. Uh, and uh, that's super valuable. It's, it's valuable to us. Uh, but I also think it's valuable going forward. I, I think we're going to likely going to come out of this this meeting with um, some people feeling uh, that that they've suffered some hurt and some sadness. And um, as we move forward from tonight, I think it's really important that uh, we remember that we're all in this together uh, and that we move forward in a place of open arms and open hearts and um, welcoming what's next uh, and doing our best to support each other. Uh, while also acknowledging the hurt and sadness that that might come out of this meeting. So I just want to put that that out there uh, front um, and center. Um, again, we're going to have public comment. Be cognizant that we have have heard an immense amount from the public, and there's been a lot of of repeating themes. Um, so I would urge people to be, be pretty short in their public comment unless you feel you're bringing something something really new uh, for the I think the purpose of of allowing this meeting to to, to move forward. Um, remember that that we we have heard you. the The emails have been uh, very articulate uh, and very voluminous, uh, and we definitely are hearing you know a lot of of common themes. Uh, so. Um, I definitely want to want to open it up for public comment, but um, you know, given given what we've heard in our emails, uh, I'm guessing that a lot of people will will be saying uh, similar things here. So if, if we can try to keep remarks brief, um, great. And also, if you've sent in an email, we've we've heard you. Um, there's not necessarily uh, a need to to say it again unless unless you want to. Um, but we have read all the emails. We've responded to many of them. We have not responded to most of them. And I apologize to folks who have not gotten a response yet, but um, we have read them all. And, and uh, if, you don't get a if you haven't gotten a response yet, you will soon. Uh, I think it might make sense to give us a little bit of time to maybe discuss the makeup of the, the Roxbury Committee. It does not on here unless I didn't see it. No, we didn't put it on there. Yeah, let's, let's put it on because we may want to at least give that a few minutes of discussion uh, in this meeting. Sure. Um, yeah, and um, you know, again, uh, thank you to everyone. Uh, and we'll, we'll, have, we'll have public comment. Uh, you know, please keep it as, as brief as possible. Um, I don't think I need to remind people, but also, please keep it as as respectful as possible. Everyone in here has has good intentions, um, even if if hard decisions need to be made. So, um, if people could just, how many people want to speak? Let me just get a sense. Um, if you could raise your hand, <clears throat> I'm not seeing a ton. Um, why don't people just just come up then? I, I was gonna maybe have people line up, but I don't know if, if we have that much volume. Um, please come up. Try to keep your comments to thirty seconds to a minute. I'm not gonna keep time unless I see that being broken a lot, and then I may just to to move things along. But 
um, if you could, you know, uh, 30 seconds to a minute, roughly. Uh, and again, I, I won't keep time, but if, if the first several are, are long, I, I may start um, keeping a little, little check on that. So, uh, and, and again, we will not respond directly to these, but obviously we are, we're very much listening. So whoever wants to come first, please come up, um, announce yourself. Uh, thanks to Mia, there are, there are uh, items of fuel on the desk. Uh, you don't have to speak a public comment to have one of those. Yes, you can exactly. just have one. <laughs> Mike Branch, I'm from Roxbury. Proud graduate of Roxbury Elementary School. Uh, I'll be quick. The select board of Roxbury has sent a letter I would just request that that be entered into the minutes of this meeting, if it's not already, so that folks can review the feedback from the town representatives. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Busy. Try to be 30 seconds. Uh, my name is Jesse Remick, my Montpelier resident, father to a sophomore at Montpelier High School, who she's been fortunate enough to be a part of this school system from the very beginning. First, I thank you all for all you do for our community. I think it's greatly underappreciated, every one of you. So um, I sent a letter to you all. Um, I'm going to only summarize. I personally am in favor from a fiscally responsible standpoint of closing Roxbury and not cutting educational program. Um, so I'm going to read the last little bit of the letter I sent. I don't pretend this won't come easy for all of us. I certainly don't know the hardships that anyone else faces. Whether it's the distance from Roxbury to Montpelier, increase in property taxes or rent, we all have challenges. But to keep a building open, we're proposing cutting program, buses, and staff. These cuts will impact all students, those currently at RVS, but also those students at UES and MHS, whom are both Rock Montpelier and Roxbury students alike. We need to be decisive it will grant us the ability to have time, not time to kick the can down the road by delaying a fiscally responsible decision and using valuable savings in the process, but time to do it right. Time to give the teachers who won't be part of this long-term decision to make changes for themselves. Time for improving busing to work better for our Roxbury neighbors and younger student population. Even if that means reducing the savings closing Roxbury gains, it's critical to get the busing right. Time to talk through how to make this transition work as best as possible, I worry you lose valuable time to plan if we delay what feels like the inevitable. Thank you, Good evening. My name is Chris Smart. I'm a Montpelier resident. And I want to thank you just the same. I know this is a difficult decision you have to make. And as I understand it, you're coming down to one of two things. You're either going to vote on a budget tonight where you preserve Roxbury's operations for a year, or you don't. And for 25 years, I've lived in Montpelier, and for 24 straight years, I voted for the school budget. And this last time, I didn't. And it's because of what it costs to maintain Roxbury. And I think by maintaining it, we are hurting the overall educational quality of our school district, all of us. So let's just think about what we've got here. If we close Roxbury now, we preserve our capital reserves. What, like 900,000? If we preserve, if we close Roxbury now, there will be a place for most, if not all, the Roxbury uh, teachers to land in Montpelier because of people retiring. If we close Roxbury now, there will be a chance to fund a real robust after school program at Roxbury School. And we can focus as the last speaker just talked about and making sure the school busing is as robust and helpful to those students in Roxbury as it can be. And these are really important considerations. If we don't close Roxbury now, we lose, and this is the most critical thing I think of all, we lose that huge amount of capital reserves, close to a million dollars. And in a little town of 8,000 people, 
that's a lot of money. And so I'm going to say this to you is that as a voter who is very pro-education, I don't want you cutting staff. I don't want you cutting programs. I'm supporting that. But we cannot waste our capital reserves on preserving a school. I don't think that's prudent. So I urge you, some of this is going to be a very tough decision, but I urge you all to consider, let's just pull, let's close it and make the best we can of it, helping the whole district out in the process. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm George Wilson, a uh, retired educator and a uh, Montpelier resident. Um, since its inception, uh, I, this um, union, I believe that this union was untenable. And I expressed that in a letter to the Montpelier School Board many years ago. Eventually, I would like to see this union dissolved. However, in the interim period, I'd urge you to close Roxbury School and bring the students and faculty to Montpelier, just as the previous speaker said, and I'll amplify that and also uh, at parroting it. This is the best option that will protect Montpelier's educational programs and support the Montpelier taxpayers. In economic terms, uh, this uh, choice is about opportunity costs, um, also known as alternative costs, which is the difference between keeping Roxbury School open and other options that must be foregone because of that choice. Thank you. Right. Here, everyone. Ryan Zajac. So let me ask honestly, we'd rather be someplace else right now. <laughs> 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 now, thank you all for being here. I would just like to make out <clears throat> one quick observation, one point. Our agenda for tonight's meeting indicates there's a discussion about busing and transitioning RVS kids to UES. It was not on the agenda to close RVS. There was a agenda item to talk about transitioning one, kids from one school to another. I hope our discussion this evening follows that same language and the discussion around closure leaves our board discussion for a while and we talk about transitions rather than closures. So thank you all for your service and thank you. Thanks, Thanks Ryan. Thanks, Thanks Ryan. Hello, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, my name is Dan McGuire. I am not a voter here. I'm, I'm a Northfield resident, but I am a teacher at the middle school. Um, and I just wanted to put a plug in, which I know you've heard through emails and petitions that students have made, that um, there's a slim chance, but there is a chance that the after school coordinator at the middle school, Drew McNaughton, might be cut. And I think that would be a ridiculous disservice to everyone in this district, especially the children. Um, I work with Drew every day, and uh, I don't think anyone at our school is more dedicated or cares more about the kids. Right now, he's at Bolton Valley, and he will be at Bolton Valley or working with kids to get them home until about 10 p.m. when he gets home. Uh, and that's only one of the services that would go away if he was no longer with us. Um, so I think, I mean, I know it's a slim chance, but I hope that that becomes a 0% chance um, because uh, like I said, he's more dedicated than any other person at our school. Um, the kids love him and skiing isn't the only thing that would go away. Uh, mountain biking, after school, canoe camp, uh, the clubs he does in the summer, a for-profit, um, you know, after-school replacement would basically become daycare. And Drew is a lot more than that. So I ask you, you know, please, um, whatever you need to do, I know that's a hard decision. Please um, keep Drew in his current position. Thanks. Hi, my name is Ben Pincus, and I know I've spoken to you all before. I just uh, really quickly want to mention I was trying to advocate for advocate for Roxbury Village School in Montpelier, and um, I started crying in front of a complete stranger, just explaining what was happening. And 
she ended up hugging me and saying, you know, uh, I have a place for you since uh, uh, there's a men's group my husband's in and you can join it for, it's a good place for, a good place to send sensitive men like you. <laughs> anyway, so this has been a really emotional thing for me. And I want to say um, after several years of state subsidized tax, um, property tax stability, um, I know Montpelier faces an egregious tax hike, tax hike of 24%, um, but there's no parity comparing a one-year tax hike to the destruction and devastation of an entire town. I've been researching what happens when a town loses its school. It's, it's no small thing, right? This level as, leveled aspirations, crushed dreams, right? The tax base um, shrinks. Um, when me and my wife, 10 years ago, I grew up in Roxbury, we moved away. We moved back to raise our children in Roxbury. And we went to the playgrounds 10 years ago. My younger son was three, my older, maybe six. And we looked in the, we're playing in the playground with our kids. And we looked through the windows at Roxbury Village School. And we saw the artwork on the walls and how wonderful the place was. And we said, yes, this is where we want to raise our, our kids. This is where we want to live and die. And I just, I just want to say there's, um, Roxbury residents also face a painful tax hike. We're in this together. And because we're in a consolidated school district, we are in the same community. Because we're 20 miles apart, doesn't, doesn't eliminate the fact that we have this connection, that we share a community. Um, Roxbury is about to lose its school. It's worth asking, why aren't more parents and Roxbury kids, Roxbury parents and kids in this room? In fact, one school board member at the last meeting in Roxbury said, how come there aren't more people in this room? I'll tell you why. Because it's hard when you're a working parent and you have young children that you have to feed. feed. And equity is, if you just talk about equity, you're not providing it. Equity would actually be the school board making sure there's some ways those people can come and come and support that meeting. Um, I have uh, just uh, really quickly, um, uh, this process has been so rapid and ruthless. There's been no time really to include parents and children in Roxbury in a thoughtful process. It, and I'm not recommending a separation from, I don't even know what it's called, a deconsolidation, leaving this district. But I know I've spoken to Red about it, and I know it's a process. A committee has to be formed. You have to appeal to the State Board of Education, in my understanding. And it's a process that requires extensive thought and research. It's a big deal if we ever were to leave the Montpelier community. I'm not saying we should, but how can it be that that process is so carefully thought out, but the, 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 the existential, existential crisis that town is thrown into by losing its school, its only school, people won't want to move there. I already speaking to a mom who's decided to educate her, school, her children at home, rather not knowing what's going to happen with RBS. Um, and, um, you know, I, I want to quote diversity advocate Verna Myers. She said, diversity is getting invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance. We haven't been included. We haven't been invited to this dance because that takes time. It's hard to advocate for your children, for your town, when you feel you have no voice. That's other reason why people don't show up and that the system is fundamentally rigged against you. I would also like to really emphasize Act 127 was based on an average number of the cost per pupil. But time and time again, I've heard those numbers separated out as if Roxbury is a separate entity. But we're, we're in the same district. So to, to discuss, to present it as Richard Shear and a whole bunch of other people have done in Montpelier, who've been fighting to close the school, and I've even heard school board members do the same thing, by separating out the numbers of, of the cost per pupil basis of Roxbury from Montpelier when we're the average has affected us all in losing funds through Act 127 is incredibly inequitable. It's beyond inequitable. I would say you cannot make any claim to progressive education. I just you know, don't want to go there, but I will. But if we were a predominantly people of color community and you did that, imagine the cries, the outcries that would come up. So 
This is, it's classist, it's inequitable, it's unfair. Um, and I should say, um, uh, you know, I'm appealing to everyone. I actually want to appeal to teachers. I know you guys are really unfair. I'd love to hear teachers speak out. Um, it's definitely inequitable and unfair for the teachers too to be caught in this situation. Um, and our districts certainly merged, but there's been no effort or attempt to create a community between the districts. I don't think anyone in Montpelier who voted against the budget probably has a grandchild or child or family in, in, in Roxbury. I would think he would have maybe not have voted against the budget if he did have that connection, any community relationship. Um, no one made an effort to recognize the humanity of our kids. I went to this ridiculous speech at Kellogg Hubbard Library presentation um, that Jim Murphy also supported there, where this gentleman named Richard Shear said these incredibly unempathetic, incredibly awful things about Roxbury, claiming that we were subsidized, as if that's some kind of code word. We're all subsidized. We all had stabilized, what, three, four years of stabilized taxes. So this Montpelier was subsidized by the state of Vermont and Roxbury was also subsidized. So get away from these code words. Um, and then I know I'm going on long, I'm almost done. I just wanna mention that um, the RVS after school director, Casey Cyril said some really wonderful things about, and I know you guys received that letter, but just about how wonderful small town education is and how how caring everyone faculty and staff are at rvs towards their children towards their children and, and no doubt union elementary school is a wonderful school too but i know it's been said but three hours of transportation time for uh, a five-year-old traveling from east roxbury and back round trip a day is is unacceptable um, there's no equity there if you the child is sleep deprived anxious and stress in, com in com comparison to a Montpelier um, Union Elementary child walking only five minute walk to the school. No comparison. Um, we need more time. We need more time to plan for a future and investigate how to sustain and save our economy and livelihoods in the event of losing our school. Um, I, we need more time. I spoke to Jay Hooper today, our state rep, and he clearly stated it's possible that um, the legislators can kind of get us out of this, this mess, unlikely, but that one year of planning will make a big difference in us determining the future of our school. Um, we need to be invited to the dance. And it's ironic that in order to divorce, to divorce Roxbury from Montpelier, I don't think this is a good option, but uh, you know, I, I mentioned this, that this is a complex process that would have to happen, but we're rushing in this process in what, two weeks? I know that you have all, um, you all have to meet the, the needs of the kids first and foremost, but have you guys reached out with interactive public forums? This isn't an interactive public forum. This feels more like I'm testifying in a court of law. Um, you haven't, right? Have you conducted surveys about, for, you know, from Roxbury children and parents? You haven't. Have you received feedback from all these parents and children? You have not. You speak about equity for all the children, but have you invited everyone to the dance? No, you have not. We need more time. I sh should also mention that many people in Montpelier have on some level been complicit in the planned death of our school. I'm shocked by the patronizing attitudes of so many people. And I'd be so angry if I was a teacher, because I when I spoke out in meeting at Kayla Cupboard, a woman approached me and said patronizingly, you understand, People might not show up. Teachers might not show up in September. I said, I know that. And their wish is coming true. How does it make your teachers feel knowing that people are trying to weigh the system against you by sowing doubt regarding your job security? Another person approached me, actually the same guy who ran that meeting said, after I mentioned this editorials, the immediate closure of school reflected no empathy or care in Roxbury children. Um, and this is the guy who said subsidize. He said, you know, RVS did make a great community center. How does that make you feel when someone has no empathy, has no, no care, no kindness? And again, I understand 25% is tax hike is, is unacceptable, but we're in this together and that's the nature of school consolidation. 
anyway, um, I've spoken enough, um, but I would just say that the tremendous amount of hostility and lack of empathy is also counterbalanced by two things. The advocacy of our Roxbury families, which has been wonderful, and also some really great supporters in Montpelier. And I know there's a huge diversity of opinion in Montpelier. And I want to thank the folk in Montpelier has actually spoken to us as if we're people, human beings, with a loving, vibrant community. Um, we, Roxbury and Montpelier, are in this together. We need to have empathy and understanding despite the fact that we're separated by 20 miles of pavement. I just want to say one thing. When does your heart really open to express care? And when does it close? Don't make your decision based on fear. Make your decision on the basis of empathy and information, listening to the needs and aspirations of Roxbury residents. We need time to plan our future, and you need to take the time to invite all of us to the dance. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Can I, can I just say, I totally understand the level of emotion involved tonight, but I think it makes sense if we don't name individuals during public comment, um, yeah. just because that could start to heighten the emotion and the tension. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I totally agree. And um, yeah, that was my initial comment to try to keep it respectful and I think as impersonal as, as possible. Uh, uh, anyone next? Hello. Um... My name is Katya Sinkova. I am I used to go to Montpelier. You speak up a little bit. I'm sorry. So my name is Katya Sinkova, and I used to go to the Montpelier Middle School, and um, I don't go there anymore because I'm from Roxbury, and uh, yeah. So have you talked to any of the children at the school, in our school in Roxbury, whether they would like the school to be closed. Did you look at them and look in their eyes and say, I'm gonna close your school. You're not gonna have the school anymore. You're not gonna have these children. You're not gonna have your friends around this much. You'll be an entirely, it'll be an entirely new school. Won't know anyone. We'll have to get to know so many other kids, so many other kids. And I don't think this is fair. Because I live in Roxbury, I and I used to go to the Montpelier school. I had to spend forty-five minutes driving on a bus to get here every day. I had to wake up at six, sometimes five thirty, because I have um, goats. I have to milk them. I have to do farm work, and then I had to go to school. And that was really just too much for me. So now I'm homeschooled because of that. But my main point is Roxbury Village School means a lot to me and a lot to other people. And I hope you will consider that. I'll just say for the fourth time, I, for the life of me, I don't understand why you can't have microphones. <laughs> we have them in our town meeting. It seems like Montpelier could provide that. You know, it's not that big a deal. You got a mic here, but to, you know, it's pretend. Anyway, I wanted to speak basically to Montpelier residents. There's a lot of misinformation out there. And I, this thing keeps going over in my head. You know, somebody from Montpelier said, well, when Roxbury kids had school choice, nobody came to Montpelier. So why, you know, why should we care about them? Well, the truth of the matter is that when, the, when most of our kids who did take school choice, and school choice is a very expensive proposition for a family to take. 
they went to U32. Now, why did they go to U32? Well, I'll tell you a little anecdote about my son. He came to live with us when he was 13, came from Florida. And my wife took him to, to uh, we were in district with Northfield at that time. She took him to, to register for uh, middle school. And the guidance counselor said they were trying to figure out how to place him in the school. They didn't look at his grades. They didn't look at his tra any transcript or anything else. They said, who are your friends? So he said, well, you know, so and so and so and so, all Roxbury kids. Immediately, she put him in the lower track. No college, no pr college prep courses. Of course, my wife jumped right up off, off the floor and put an end to that really quick. He's now the vice president of his, of a, structural engineering firm in West Palm Beach. I mean, he put himself through college. And the reason, the reason that there's been so much animosity between, that is the reason between Roxbury and Northfield and why people didn't want to combine with them. And the other thing is that the people who moved here in the early 70s, like I did, were very politically um, active and progressive. And that fit U32's mold. It was the high school with no walls, you know? They got walls now because it didn't work. But that was, you know, that's where our kids fit in. When Ben came, he was the groundbreaker going to U32. His parents moved here from, from Massachusetts. They lived in, they came from Cambridge. They were Harvard people. His mother is one of the authors of Our Bodies Ourselves, you know. So, so they, they were not, they were progressives, and they fit into U32 mold. That's nothing against Montpelier. It's just the way it was, you know. But the fact is that if, if a kid came to U32, I mean to Montpelier at the same time, being a a consolidated school district, all self-contained, they may have gotten the same treatment that my son got in Northfield. You know, well, you're from Roxbury, we'll put you in a shop class. You know, you don't need to take calculus or whatever. You know, that's a very, a very great possibility. Uh, there, was a, there was another issue uh, when, when the Merger committee was active. Um, Forrest Twombly, he addressed the committee and said that the, one of the reasons, the other reasons that they went to U32 was that U32 was a, was a hub school and all the schools that contributed were small from small towns. There was no, oh, you're from so-and-so or you're from so-and-so. That didn't happen because everybody was from someplace. You know, it's like, oh, you're from Massachusetts. Well, everybody's from someplace, you know, unless you're in Abenaki. But the point is that that's one of the reasons, that, that another reason that people chose U32. And, and Montpelier's got kind of a kind of a um, inferiority complex about that. That people chose U32 over Montpelier. Well, I could go into that, but I won't. Um, Anyway, I think that it, it's, it's a, a decision that one of the reasons I came tonight, the weather's terrible, but I wanted to look into the faces of the people that are gonna kill our town. I wanted to really, really seriously look deep in the eyes of the people that are gonna vote to kill our community. We got into this mess with you guys, driven into it by the state, and you were driven into it by the state because you didn't know that you were protected from merger. Had you known that you were protected from merger by the number of students you had, you never would have merged with Roxbury, but you needed us much more than actually we probably needed you. But the point is that now you feel like you don't need us, so you can just cast us aside. 
Well, I, you know, I just hope that, you know, Ben said one person was thinking about homeschooling. I hope that every Roxbury parent homeschools because all you're using us for is to infill your student deficit and, and to decrease your student, um, your uh, per student cost. And at this point, given all the talk that we've had, the difference between a Roxbury student cost and UES student cost is $5,000 a year. That's all. And that's pro and, and how much does it cost? Do you think you could drive somebody back and forth to Montpelier for five thousand dollars? I don't think so. It's just transportation, and you're not going to get rid of the district. This five thousand five hundred thousand dollars that the district charges off to Roxbury. You know, when I worked for an engineering company years ago, we always had one big account and a lot of little accounts. And if you didn't have it, you know, if you had time. And you didn't quite know where to put it, you put it on that big account, you know? And that's kind of the way Libby has portrayed this thing. She has put this $500,000 of district money against us and then saying that that's all gonna go away when we, when we merge. Well, of course it's not gonna go away. It's just gonna be, redistributed, you know? It's gonna be charged back to that big account. You know, here's the, here's, the, here's the chart she sent me. I showed you this before. Jim says it's bogus, but it's, this one, this one. $5,000 diff difference between students. And yet everybody thinks that and says, and then almost in such a derogatory manner that, oh, Roxbury kids would be better off at UBS. Well, you know, I don't believe that. My two girls graduated from UES. They're both very successful. And I'm from, not from UES, from RVS. It's an acronym business. Um, UES is not, is not the be all end all. Everybody thinks it is. And they're only saying that because you need us for infill. You need us to fill your seats. And if you don't get them, then you're gonna to have to pay a higher tax rate. Well, the tax rates, according to the statistics, aren't that much different. It's just that Montpelier property values are much higher than they are in Roxbury. So if you have a problem with your taxes, move to Roxbury. Buy a house, you know, get a less, you got the same tax rate, but you're, you you do not pay that extra $800 a year. It's a very simple solution. Sell your house and move. <laughs> very simple. Send your kid to the Roxbury School. We need the numbers too. Thank you. <laughs> That's a good song too, actually. Yeah, there's some books online and uh, yeah, let's do Steve. Hey, Julie's here. Got some oh, Julie, here. yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Julie Smart. I'm a special education teacher at Union. Um, I live in Montpelier and I'm the parent of two kids who went all the way from kindergarten through 12th grade. So I have lived this system from the inside and out and seen the benefits um, in so many ways. Um, I've been teaching in public school in this county for 25 years. I'm clearly an avid supporter of public education and I spend most of my waking hours thinking about what's best for kids, all kids. I'm concerned about all 1,000 students in this district, including the students at Roxbury. There are cuts on the table that impact hundreds of families. For example, to reduce or eliminate busing raises serious equity issues for many families. 
families that have one car, families that have no cars. We have spent a lot of work trying to improve our attendance in this district, especially since COVID. I'm worried about hindering that when we talk about things like busing. We're also proposing using almost $1 million from our reserve fund. That's our savings account. And I feel strongly it could better serve all students if we spend it slowly and wisely. When Roxbury didn't have a special education teacher several years ago, my colleagues and I stepped up to support families with special needs and their families, um, the students and the families at Roxbury. We case managed and we taught over Google Meet because that was what Roxbury needed. We care about Roxbury. We welcome them to UES. We're a school where we have teams of interventionists. We have teams of special educators. Roxbury teachers can move into teaching positions that are, will be open this fall. It's beautiful when teachers don't lose jobs over transitions like this. Um, I feel like colleagues um, from Roxbury will have many more colleagues at a larger school in Montpelier and access to a lot of professional development. I think peers, um, kids have more peers and kids have more friends. It is hard to run a kindergarten with three students. You simply um, can have more um, robust education when you have even slightly larger numbers. I propose that we thoughtfully start a transition for these families and students now. We don't actually have to wait for the vote to happen. We could start that process and that thinking now and hopefully use it when it's most relevant, whether it's this year or next year. Roxbury students can be well-educated at UES without harming the greater system. I feel the reverse is no longer true. $1.5 million in cuts to services and staff will compromise the greater system for all of our students. I ask you to consider that we can best meet the educational needs of all students under one roof in one welcoming community in Montpelier. Thank you. Before we go online, anyone else in the room? Um, Okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll go online. So we have Steve, Emma, David, and Melissa. I think Steve should be up. Steve, you all set? I'm all set. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Hi, I'm Steve Cease. I and my wife live here in Montpelier on North Street. Um, we have been here for enough time to raise two daughters who went all the way through the Montpelier school system with great results and um, their education has provided them with a really, I think, strong foundation for their present lives. I'm here to um, just try to make two points. Obviously, you're here to try to devise a budget that will pass the voters. But I think as you do that work, you need to remember another goal, which is to do the least damage to educational services in the system. And I really believe that the least damage to be done is unfortunately to close the Roxbury School. But I do think that by doing that, you will preserve educational services at the, end, element, at the high school, the middle school, and the elementary school. The, the superintendent has implied or, or actually said that keeping the Roxbury Village School open for another year may be difficult because of staffing problems and the uncertainty of uh, how many teachers will want to remain there with the belief that the school might close in another year. If, if you try to keep the Roxbury Village School open, it seems to me that ironically, Roxbury kids will suffer in all three schools from cuts at the high school and all middle school and perhaps at the Roxbury School. I really think that the best option uh, for all students and to provide the greatest protection for educational services is to close the village school and um, do the uh, do everything we can to make the transition as as uh, painless as possible for the kids. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Uh, and Emma. looks like a familiar name, Emma. I think you can go. If yeah, you... she's, yeah. That's on her, Emma. Yeah. Emma, if you're talking, you are still muted. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear? 
Yes, yes. we got you now. Uh, my name is Emma Bay Hansen. I'm a Montpelier resident, parent to two MRPS students and former board member. I deeply appreciate the work of each member on this board, particularly the student representatives. From COVID to flooding to this unimaginable budget dilemma you find yourselves in, each and every one of you has come to the table week after week with the best intention for the students in the district in mind. I know most of you are morally conflicted with the decisions being made tonight, and yet you show up, persevere, face your constituents, and engage. Thank you for the public service that you've given to this community. In the past few weeks, I've seen my friends, neighbors, and family try their best to fully understand Act 127 and the budget decisions and implications that are still underway. Montpelier has a history of supporting equity, being empathetic, and putting our money where our values are. That is what Act 127 is supposed to be about, providing more equity in the education for all of Vermont students. However, this situation that we find ourselves in now is a test of our progressive values. We want equity for all of Vermont's children, but we don't want, to, we don't want it to be at the cost of a great education for the kids that need it right here in our district or on the backs of people in, in our town who are already struggling to make ends meet or stay in their homes. We want the best for Roxbury families, but our equity lens shifts when that is pitted against school enrichment and busing for some of Montpelier's most vulnerable kids. I trust people's hearts are in the right place here, but we're being forced to choose between a few terrible options with very little time for consideration. I want to lend my voice of support tonight to Roxbury families. I listened to your public comments from the last meeting. Your ask was so reasonable, humble, and clear. Just an extra year to lengthen the runway of the closure to allow your community time to process, plan, and transition gracefully. It seems only human to allow for a, for a time for a change of this magnitude and to legitimately make space for the, most, the people most directly impacted by this decision, Roxbury residents, to be part of the process. The way that this is playing out is likely that a, major of, a majority of the board members, only five people, who will likely all be Montpelier residents at the table tonight, will make a decision against the will of the people of Roxbury. That can't sit well with anyone in the room tonight or this town. I know Montpelier stands for inclusion, equity, fairness, and fidelity. I don't think anyone would have chosen this route if they didn't feel that their back was up against a wall. My heart is with Roxbury tonight. I urge board members to push for any budget item that will ease the transition that Roxbury kids and their families will likely face in the coming years. Do what you can to make this work for them. I sincerely hope that we can pick up the pieces, whatever the outcome of the budget vote is tonight, support each other, bring our communities together and, pro and continue to provide high quality education to all students in this district. Thank you. Thanks Emma. Uh, and Melissa. Melissa. Hi, I know you've heard from me quite a few times, but I will I appreciate your thoughts, Emma. Um, that was very nice. Uh, sorry, uh, going after her is a little difficult. Um, I just want to echo what many have said and my own thoughts. Putting the, I understand this was created by legislatures and, and Act 127 and various other forms, but it appears to me as a Roxbury resident and a mom of a elementary kid, as well as an MSMS, that we are putting this entire burden on Roxbury. And I don't think that's fair. These kids, the school is more than just the education they receive when they're sitting in the classroom. It's the opportunities they have outdoors. It's the after school program. It's the person caring that they get an extra helping at lunch because you know they're not being fed at home. Um, it's the community we build. So when they do transition to the middle school and high school, they're also looked after. I myself have uh, witnessed one of our Roxbury kids miss the bus because their teacher let them out late at MSMS and literally be devastated standing on the front lawn of MSMS, not knowing what to do. And thankfully I was there picking up my daughter and rang the bell to the school and explained to them that the bus had left without that child and making sure their parent knew because the school did not have an appropriate contact number for that parent and reached out to, of all places, the RVS after school program to get a contact number for that parent. And I transported that child back to Roxbury. Until my child went to Roxbury, I did not go into that town I live basically on the town of Northfield town line. 
I did not go there except to vote until my children went to that school. If I didn't have RVS and that child did not learn to know me by being at RVS, I would not have been a resource for her standing on the front lawn of MSMS with no way to get home. That is what this school provides for our children when they do transition to Montpelier. Our children choose to come back to Roxbury to help with the after school program. One, because they feel the need to give back to the program that gave them so much. And two, because it feels like home. They're comfortable there. That comfort is built kindergarten through fourth grade. And to lose that opportunity to our children and to our community to make that transition to middle school a little bit easier. I can't imagine somebody who has been sending a kindergartner next year, hearing all of this and thinking they were going to send their child to Roxbury and now having to face the fact of sending their child to UES as a brand new kindergartner in a family that has no connection to the school and has no resources to help them. That is what I fear. The rest of us, we know each other, we'll figure it out. But those coming years of children, especially this incoming kindergarten class, they don't have that if you close Roxbury. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, we have Casey Jane. Yes. Uh, okay. I think you're able, if you take yourself off mute, I think you're able to speak. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, well, I live in Montpelier. I've lived here since 1975, raised two kids. Uh, uh, I would oh. say in the Montpelier school system, but U32 worked for one of them. Montpelier worked for the other. Uh, I'm really not wanting to comment on on schools and the quality of education because I think that's been done and said. What I what I really don't hear anybody addressing is the fact that we are an older population. Our incomes are fixed. And regardless of where the money is spent, it is increasingly 20% more every year. And that's not Roxbury's fault. You know, if anything, it's health insurance premiums that keep coming up. And, and I think that um, what has to get acknowledged is that this isn't a statement about values. It's a statement about, can I afford to still live in Vermont without being taxed out of my home? That's all. Hey, can you say your name again, please, just for the, the record? I'm sorry? Could you say your name again, please, just yes. for the record? My name, my name is Jane Cast, K-A-S-T. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Jane. Is that all? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, everyone. Um, we really appreciate the, the further comments um, and uh, the, uh, the thoughtfulness and, and respectfulness that, that went into them. Uh, we do, before I get to the meat of the discussion, we have um, a consent agenda. Our consent agenda is effectively kind of pro forma items that uh, the board just has to move to keep things flowing. Uh, they're generally non-controversial things like approval of last week's minutes, uh, our warrant for payroll, et cetera. Uh, and we usually do not discuss them and approve them en masse unless someone pulls in the, an item out. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move to approve the consent agenda with the addition of the warrant and the co-curriculars. Okay. Because those came in. Those came later. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, now to board discussion. Do we want to show the slides or do we just want to? Totally up to you. Let's show, let's show the slides just so I'm not sure so everyone in the room and online can know what we're talking about. 
Um, and then we can. Yeah, I don't know if people are going to be able to see them, but that's all right. Is it possible for Anna to broadcast them right now to share screen? Oh, yeah, the, right. yeah, yeah, I'm just getting to the right screen. That's Maybe all. Is this what you sent? I can remember what day that was. Yeah. Monday, yep. I think. It feels like three months ago. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah, so if people need to move, feel free to, it's not that long. Um, so here are some revised budget scenarios in the last board meeting, the board requested that I bring to them a 16 to 18% budget, leaving Roxbury Village School in the budget. Um, so we have done that as well as a 14% increase, thinking about the feedback that the board has gotten from over 250 emails um, that have come in since we started this budget process. So uh, the outcomes, just to remind the board of what you need to do tonight, your main role is to approve a general budget for FY25 that can be warned um, for the school budget vote on April 30th. So we leave this meeting and we need to have an approved budget number for the town clerks in order to get their process going. Uh, Remind, I think Jim talked to John Obens. I think the latest he said was Friday, but the earliest, he said the earlier, the better to get yes. that warning to him. Friday of this week. Yes. Yeah. So your job tonight is to, <laughs> is to uh, warn a budget member. Yes. Or approve a warning. Um, just a reminders uh, is that the FY24 general budget was 28,608,500. Uh, the failed FY24, Five proposed general budget from town meeting was just over 32 million. The a 1% decrease in tax rate equals decreasing that failed budget number by uh, $206,000. These are just all reminders. All of these numbers that I'm showing you tonight are assuming a $10,000 dollar yield um, for a projection. Keeping in mind the dollar yield is not set in stone until the legislature does that in late May, sometimes early June. Um, and it is not at 10,000 yet, uh, but I think that's a pretty safe bet for it to go around 10,000, uh, seeing what other school districts are doing in the state and reducing their budget from all the failed budget votes. Uh, outside of staffing and programs, just a reminder to the board that the most wiggle room is in uh, cutting in facilities and fund balance using either one of those options more or less has ramifications. With deferred maintenance, maintenance if you uh, to look at facilities and with losing our savings account if you use more of a fund balance. So just keeping in mind that both of those options, while there is wiggle room in these budgets presented to the board um, in those, so you could add more from either one, um, the both have ramifications. So a proposed 15.73% increase to the Montpelier tax rate could look like this. Uh, it would be a proposed budget of 31565000 We would cut $482,000 from expenses, and we would add an additional $600,000 from the fund balance, which would make the total fund balance contribution for this budget alone $1,775,000. Uh, the cuts would include athletics, a uh, piece of equipment for $30,000, technology at $18,000, 1.5 FTE uh, from our Instructional Assistance Core, 2.0 FTE from the MREA. Those would be the literacy coach position and a social work position. Both of those positions starting next school year will be unfilled or are currently unfilled. Uh, no, we looked into all of our healthcare benefits. Christina did some nice digging there and some known employees who we know are sticking around. Uh, they're budgeted for a family health care plan, so, um, but they don't take it. So that's a, an additional savings that we found of $50,000 that doesn't impact anybody. Um, and facilities would be 78,000 from uh, a cut in their budget. Um, so we could get to 15.73, assuming a $10,000 dollar yield, doing things like this. Just a reminder for the fund balance, so it's in front of the board, um, to, use, to use the fund balance to decrease tax rates further in this scenario, 
Um, like, so for instance, to get to a 14% tax rate in this scenario um, that was presented on slide three, the board would need to use $1,415,000 of fund balance. So a total of 475 that the board has already put towards it, um, that is already encumbered. And then an additional $940,000 from the fund balance. This would leave the board with 737 plus some change in the fund balance above the policy reserve limit. Um, and you, we could also talk about other cuts that were presented on March 12th, which is linked there for the board if they want to reference those slides. This would essentially eliminate the opportunity for the board to continue to encumber fund balance money in future budgets because there wouldn't be enough money to do that. You could probably do it for one more year and that's it. We could do a proposed 13.84% increase to the Montpelier tax rate. That would be a proposed budget of 30,575,415. We would cut 1,470,700 from, from expenses. The cuts would include busing students who currently attend RVS to Union and the savings that that implies there. It would be the 2.0 2 MREA, MREA positions that are both unfilled, 1.5 Marissa positions, unused healthcare benefits, the technology, the athletic equipment, and facilities. Remember, that's where wiggle room is there. So doing $64,000 in facilities cuts. This proposal assumes the district attempts to run an after-school program at RVS and keeps an addi the additional bus. So have the Roxbury Village, the bus that is currently servicing Roxbury Village School, keep that in the budget to help with transportation challenges. Potential future use of the fund balance with a 14% budget proposal, because you notice it's not in that. The board would have um, $1,677,450 for potential PCB mitigation and remediation. Uh, the, the testing for MHS has moved up and it begins over spring break. Continue with a contribution from fund balance to reduce tax, tax rates throughout the next four years. That is currently not encumbered. So the board has been in a position since to FY21 where the board has encumbered money ahead of time. So you knew that $400,000 could be used towards that budget year for almost the entirety of my superintendency. Right now that is not planned for FY26. So, so if you kept your fund balance, you could plan that for future years. Uh, potential building renovation work with the likelihood in future years that we no longer uh, fund a capital plan, which the voters approved on March 5th. Um, alternatively, the board could decide to add more fund balance to this particular budget to further decrease the tax rate in FY25. It, and just because I was playing with numbers earlier, it, another $600,000 to this particular budget scenario brings the uh, Montpelier tax increase down to 11%. The one if you go back one slide? Yes. 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 Yeah, because yes. yeah, 200,000 equals. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And can I ask a question about that 50,000? Because I'm a little. The 50,000 for what? The 50,000 from benefits not used. Yep. I'm a little reluctant to include it because my understanding is it's, is it's benefits that could be used. And I know it's not planned, but family situations can change. And if this... they elect to use it in November, we have to give it to them, right? Yes. I know, you're, I know you feel confident yes. what happened. <laughs> it is, but, it is, we are pretty but, confident yeah. in, that, in that situation. Okay. Um, but, but, but yes, you are yeah. accurate in that. And every year we have people switch healthcare. I mean, that, that's, a, yeah. that's a guessing game sometimes. And when we have new employees come in, we budget for a family, but they may have a single or they may have a pair, you know? So every but year healthcare is, a yeah. Spouse. yeah. 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 That's it. That's but, all I got. But that, that is not a huge amount to make. It's not a huge amount, no. It's got his hand up. Um, on the 13.84 one, um, I noticed, what was it last week or at our, our last meeting, um, there was $400,000 yeah. for district services. So does that mean, is that something regarding the building, like keeping? So we put in, assuming we don't get the grant for the after school. Because that, that's what last week was assuming, that there was a grant that was going to be gotten with $150. So 
$150,000. So that's assuming that we don't have a grant and we need to fund an after school program. This is assuming that. Yes. Right. Yep. And the Boston Roxbury and facilities changes with Andrew looking at facilities a little bit closer in terms of if we had partial use of the building, how much would the facilities budget that he has at Roxbury be reduced? So we would, we would continue to have that building as part of the district for another year yeah. in this plan? Yeah. Thanks. This is Kristen. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. I don't, sorry if I just uh, interrupted somebody else, but I guess I'll just formally sure. raise my hand. You can go for it. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, kind of uh, piggybacking on Jake there. Um, could you, Libby, give specific numbers to what's been included in this budget in terms of a commitment around an after school program and the additional bus in terms of, you know, just the the dollar amount associated with those two things? And are they coming out of the fund balance? Or can you tell us any more about the source for those funds? No, they'd be budgeted in our local budget, not in okay. fund balance. So okay. we wrote a grant for $150,000 for the after school. The after school, in reality, Christina can correct me if I'm wrong, it's approximately $200,000 because we didn't budget in healthcare costs and things like that. Yes. So the after school program at, R at RVS without the grant and without parental contributions is probably around $200,000. And then the bus is just the, the bus. It's like 70 to $72,000. So that is not taken out of this budget that is included in this budget, still in the local fund. Yep. Nothing okay. in this budget is taken, with the exception of the 475 that the board has already encumbered, there is no additional fund balance in this scenario. That's not to okay. say the board can't put more fund balance towards this scenario, but it's not. There is no assumption that any of the services for after school or busing for Roxbury would be taken out of a fund balance. Okay, thank you. Are we still going for that grant or where are we at the- is It's that, at the AOE. Is that AOE? Mm -hmm. Do you have like a prospect or? <laughs> is there a determination time? Not that I know of. Kristen, do you know when that grant comes back? I know you are close to the after school world. Do you know when yeah. there's a new decision? I, I don't definitively know that, no. Do you, do you know if the... Um, oh, Shannon says mid-April. Sorry, go ahead, Ryan. <laughs> um, does it have to be associated with the Roxbury Village School? Yes. Or does it go to the district? It was written for Roxbury Village School. Specifically, like there, there's targets in there specifically for Roxbury Village School. <clears throat> yeah. You and others have noted that even if we get the grant, it could be difficult to staff that program. Mm -hmm. um, what happens to the money if we get the grant, but we can't actually run the program? Does the AOE just keep it? We don't get to keep it. I'm we guessing. would most likely be able to make a. You typically with a grant, we're we're able to make amendments. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we'd be able to do it with that grant because it's so particular to one mm -hmm. building. Mm -hmm. But typically, we can make amendments. I, I just don't okay. know. All right, I don't know. And if we're unable to amend it, then do we have to just give the money back? back? Yeah. yeah. So what what you're saying is it to in, with this scenario, the after school program at RVS is included. Yes. It, and so therefore, there's fifty thousand dollars somewhere in all of those numbers because that's the difference between what we would expect from the grant and what we what it actually costs without parental contribution. Without parental contribution, and so our sort of plan B, if we don't get the grant and we still wanted to run the program at RVS, would be parental contribution. I mean, if we wanted to still run it, we have us. enough There's in other this plans budget. We, we have enough in this budget where we wouldn't need to ask parents at Roxbury for parental contribution. But that even would, without the grant, right? Okay. Yeah. However, yeah, that would make a more robust program because they'd have more supply kind of money. Sure. Is the difference in FTE, um, the one less FTE in this budget than last week's for the after school? 
No, that was for a special educator. Um, we realized that we had included the FTE for a special educator, um, but as part of the RIF, but that was, that's not accurate. We need that for our service, for the number of services we have in our district. So we reduced that. So can you just help me, as I was trying to crosswalk last week's with this one, um, the sort of major difference was that one FTE and then there was 400 district services and 70 RBS bus. And then this week it's 125 for operations. Mm -hmm. So it's a 345 difference. You said 200 for after school, 70. Well, 70 was already for the bus. So what's the other 150? Facilities. Facilities. Kristen. All right, thank you. Um, and in terms of you know the facilities, the the money that would be put aside in this version, uh, what is that amount in terms of maintaining the building, and what does maintaining the building mean? Hold on one second, Kristen. Okay, thank you. So I asked Andrew and Tom. Andrew LaRosa is our director of facilities, and Tom Allen is our custodial supervisor for, let's see if I can find it quickly. <laughs> for just what that means, Kristen. They, yep. did that, they did that work. If we, were, if we were not using the building at all, what would it look like? Um, and then what if it would look like if we were running an after-school program? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's very brave of you to have a whole drive on. <laughs> just, thanks, <laughs> thanks for letting me know. <laughs> I know that's super small. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, it is. Can you <laughs> say that I make that I, out? I can see it. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm working on it. Hold on. Okay. Yeah, partial. Yeah, for anyone like 25 vision, I'm sure it's crystal clear. You don't get the whole thing. So these are the areas that Andrew was looking into: custodial, snow clearing, utilities, trash recycling, maintenance, repair, supplies, furnishing, lawn care. So he was looking at all the different pieces here. So, and then the red column, column D is partial, partial closure. closure of the building. And the, and the blue column, column E is full closure, I see. Hmm. And the, the total numbers, I'm sorry, are um, savings or costs? Were, uh, costs? Costs, I believe, yeah. Wait, why would it be well, well, more expensive for full way. closure? Oh, other way, sorry, savings. <laughs> And they're keeping in mind, these are Andrew and Tom's best guesses at the, yep. you know, because they're pretty detailed in terms of yep. what happens. So these are the best conservative guesses. Yep. And I appreciate that. And I do think these, you know, this does help the Roxbury community. We're not sure where this is going tonight and where this is landing yet. But I, I, I think this, these details are important in terms of the Roxbury community having a, a firm understanding and grasp on when... You know, the, the district says we are committed and we are allocating funds to maintaining the building for a year. What does that specifically mean? And wanting an assurance uh, that adequate funding has put aside to do just those things. So that's what I'm trying to. That's yeah, what I'm so trying you, can, to you can see Andrew's notes here. Sorry, I don't want to yep. cut you off, Kristen, but you, yep. can you see Andrew's notes I, here? I can, yes. Um, so it's, you know, looking at we need to heat the building every day, right? We, we need to keep the water system maintained. We need to keep all of that stuff going. So all of that is in this piece. What's not in this piece is like the summer cleaning work and any kind of, con you know, facilities work that Andrew was planning over the summer, which if the board chose to move students from, Union to, from Roxbury to Union, that wouldn't be part of the, you know, that's where the extra money comes from in that operations budget. That's not included here. This, the question I gave to him was like, the, when school is in session, what would it look like for our custodial crew and buildings maintenance? 
Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Yep, I think I understand. Thank you. There's currently planned work for Roxbury in the summer, as there always is, in terms of cleaning classrooms and man power down there and stuff like that. Uh huh. Thank you. That's very helpful to know. Uh, here. Well, we're having this discussion about potential after school programs. If there's any possibility of RBS students. Um, attending part two at UES. Yep. There's always a possible. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody can attend part two. Um, and part two works out of Union. It's a program that has gotten its stars, stars licensure, so it can take state subsidies. Um, our program in Roxbury would not be able to do that because it wouldn't be licensed in that way. Um, but yes, Rox any student can go to part two. Are they not limited seats? Part two works so that they build their staffing around the number of kids who who oh. who attend. There probably is a limit at some point. We have not come close to it oh. in Montpelier since we started that program. Is it is it then that there are after school um, after school opportunities at the middle school that have limited? Oh, yes. Okay, that's yeah, yeah, what yeah, I, yeah. that must be what I'm Yep. Thinking. Yeah, the programming that was referenced earlier, Drew's program at the middle school is, is limited to the number of slots you can take because they're they're very specific. They're cooking or mountain biking or you know, they're not it's not child care per se, it's enrichment activities. It's about the um Montpelier or the the ones at the bottom that are in both of these um scenarios are they sort of since they're in both should we think of them as low-hanging fruit like are these things that you think are doable one one of the things i'm cognizant of is this discussion sort of that's unfortunately fallen into roxbury versus montpelier you know but i think what i'm seeing here is consensus sort of trimming that might be is is that how i should read that the That's, last five bullets that appear in bullets. both both of the scenarios yes. for tonight yes. those are sort of can do yes we don't feel like we're harming um facilities is facilities is different um but the athletic equipment we can do that uh the technology certainly we can do that i feel pretty confident about the health insurance benefits um i think we can do that uh, the two MRAA positions um, are both unfilled, and earlier in this process, the board was very concerned about um, the riff of filled positions that would affect people um, directly. And uh, so these two positions are unfilled or will be unfilled. So they seem like they that fit the mold of what the board was telling us earlier. Um, and the uh, instructional assistance roles, the leadership team came to the understanding that we could we could work without the instructional those particular positions. The reason why it says broadly instructional assistance is because I haven't had a chance to talk to the people who are in those roles. And can you say certainly there's a consideration of whether or not a position is filled, but there's I would say an even greater consideration or greater importance on what would the um, riffing of those two MREA positions do to our system? Yeah, so um, the literacy coach is a professional development position. Obviously, we have currently four coaches in our district. Um, right now, Union Elementary, or elementary school teachers, I should say, all of our elementary school teachers at K-4 are receiving significant professional learnings in a thing called letters that is very intense for them um and so they and that goes through next year so they have a lot of support in that work additionally um the professional learning community structure um which is team-based by grade particularly at union elementary is incredibly strong and so they really are getting to the point where they're learning from each other and a lot of professional learning is coming in that way which doesn't cost us any money except trying to figure out a schedule to make it work, <laughs> um, which is a time thing more than a money thing. So yes, the literacy coach position, it was agreed by the leader leadership team um, and quite honestly from staff input 
uh, that that position was one that could be um, done away with. And it's not student facing really, is it? Um, depends on how you look at it. So if the ideal literacy coach would be working intensely with teachers and modeling, modeling things for them with students. So it depends how you look at it. But um, the social work position, we currently have one, um, one, two, three, four, five social work workers in our district. Um, that's honestly, while I think needed, that is honestly a very large amount of social workers for a district of our size. Um, so it's a position that is unfilled and we believe the, the caseload could be picked up by our other okay. social workers. Thank you. We can go back to the slide. We're not going to take questions on it, though, from the audience. Well, we didn't get to really talk about it. We can, certainly, we can certainly put it up and then look at it. Let me, at one point, shortly after um, the, the vote on town meeting day, um, you were concerned that if we didn't meet the, I can't remember when it was, March 30th deadline, we would have to send RIF notices to all the teachers, which yeah. was a ridiculously horrible yeah. um, thought. And if I recall, you, you said afterwards, you would work with Joe to figure out a solution that wouldn't involve having to RIF, or at right. least notice. Um, and thank you for that. Um, have any notices gone out between the yeah. failed boat? So no, we, we had to, we had, that's not accurate, to the MREA. We had Sorry, to, according yeah. to contract, um, give a proposed RIF notice to our AFSME employees, okay. which are technology custodian. Because mm -hmm. in the in the former budget, there's a secretary position that is RIF. Okay. Um, and potentially, because we had to give it to them by May, March 15th, 15th. Yeah. Um, there is a position, an administrative position assistant. So, so it one was clearly notice. stated that this is budget dependent. The second one is yeah. budget dependent and mm -hmm. what the board decides to do, mm -hmm. um, which is what Joe and I came together to decide to is that I, we were very clear with each other. I think um, that I would send out any potential riff that could potentially happen mm -hmm. until we get a past budget. Cause it's not just you all decide tonight on a warning it has to pass right yeah so we so i would send that and it goes to joe that's who the letter goes to mm -hmm. and for those of you who don't know joe carroll is our union leader and i'm putting him on the spot right now he's in a nice flannel shirt right there smiling <laughs> um so i would send that to joe carroll and and both of us would have very clear communication mm -hmm. with our colleagues around what does this mean and what it doesn't mean and yeah. that kind of thing. It's based on budget votes and things. And, and so that will still happen. That will happen. We have to do that. Yeah. yeah. Or, Even because our vote won't be until. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. I know you don't want to hear it, but so you're going to close Roxbury School for 2%. That's what you're telling me. 13.8 versus 15. Point. Seven three two percent. You don't have to say anything. Well, now the the, the we we appreciate your input, Tom. The, the public the public comment period is over. Um, it's not it's not fair to the, the rest of the folks if we let one person interact and the rest not. It's nice people talk about the public's perspective because you know you may not have thought of that. <laughs> we we see the numbers. We see the numbers, Tom. We see the numbers. So I mean, sort of, I think you have 400 some, 460 or so thousand in those sort of consensus cuts. And then in the last year's, or last, sorry, last year, last week's um, presentation, there were a number of additional options, I think probably a lot of which most, if not all of us would say, just, you know, don't even want to go near. But if we asked you to kind of stretch um, maybe one or two more, get another 100 or 150 thou. Could you please identify where, um, where they would come 
from like what you think the next couple are if we thought some stretching on that front uh, was needed in a way that you would feel comfortable with? I would ask the board what they would want me to do. We've gotten significant feedback from the communities to not touch transportation, to not touch enrichment. Um, and so I would not recommend those positions. We have talked about another MREA position potentially. Um, however, I probably would go first because of the stress that this is causing on my system. I would go first to the fund balance. I was looking particularly at facilities where you were targeting 160 and school building budgets of 40. Would those be, you brought up the- You could, like I said in the last slide, that is where the most wiggle room is, is facilities and fund balance. We probably have some wiggle room in the school budgets. So we could do that. Um, 40,000 was a big cut to go to those school budgets, but you probably, you know, we could do some, some work there. The 160, I'll remind the board that I said last time, if we cut $160 or $60,000 from our facilities, that essentially makes facilities just health and safety, and that's it. Um, and so that's a significant amount of deferred maintenance to our facilities, our facilities, oh, period. Yep, yeah, but, you, but that would be the range between, you know, zero to 160 within facilities. And Andrew would just prioritize with whatever whatever number we come we come to. Um, but this whole process of failed boat, boat not having a, a true pass budget with the conversation around Roxbury, the instability in our system is tremendous right now. The stress level is incredibly high and I would encourage the board to think about getting a number out there that they think can pass. Um, but those are, I'd say fund balance a little bit in facilities and maybe a little bit in school budgets and possibly one MREA position. However, I would advise against that. So Libby, last week I had asked about the, um, the track. I know I'm not gonna make a lot of friends here, but the 400,000 that we have encumbered for track, I think last year, last week you mentioned that about 50 of it had been spent. So this, this week it was 60. Okay, so so in a week we've gone down to down to 340,000 and and I think I expressed how uneasy I was with the idea of of bringing students to from RVS to UES at the same time of making those improvements to to the track. Um the, the so that $340,000 savings could factor into where you were talking about the last slide number six, the, the fund balance, because I think you have, still have it as encumbered at 400,000. The right? board has to unencumber it. I yep. can't do that on my own. Yep. So the board has to take action to do that. And if the board took action to unencumber that, that would be an additional 340,000. Yes. And there's still safety things that need to happen on the track. Which could be covered by the capital. Um, no, the no. capital plan. No. no, I don't believe track work would would go there when we need a new roof here. Oh, we wouldn't do that. Do we have we'd put a roof on before we use the capital fund to do the track. <laughs> Sorry, yes. Uh, do we have any estimates from Andrew? And I know he's been um really collaborative with our, our track coaches and, and vested volunteers in trying to determine uh, what's absolutely needed to make the track safe. Um, beyond the 60,000, is there an estimated amount at this point that will be needed out of the 400,000 to get the track into a place where it is safe and usable? I think that the people who are very committed to this would say they need $400,000 <laughs> to make the track very safe and usable. Um, I think probably they could do a pretty good, it just depends on, right. You know, do you want all the track events? Do you not want all the track? We've had the conversation on the track and the people have been very vocal about what the needs are. So I'd encourage the board to go back into those public comments and conversations around that for me to pull a number out of my head. No, cause I'm not, I'm not in that yeah. meeting. I think that yep. I would I would think that if the board left two hundred fifty three hundred thousand dollars, they could make a pretty safe track. Once mm -hmm. again, yeah, I don't want you to, I don't I don't want you to pull a number out of your head for sure. I just <laughs> didn't know you know if 
kind of the analysis had gone so far as to be able to provide us a solid estimate so we could have a better understanding of what maybe could be unencumbered. But uh, but it sounds yeah, like I... don't know for sure, but possibly at a price tag of 250K, a solid track could be accomplished. Yeah, and there's, there's a Just head trying to get a sense from the track coach at, at 250 to 300. Uh, Jake. Okay. Um, if, if, uh, if somebody, you know, steps on the inside of the curb of the, of, of the track, which has been washed away and they, you know, tear the ligaments on their knee because of that, um, is that a legal liability for the school district? Yeah, that's what we have yeah, insurance absolutely. for. But it would happen if, uh, you know, yeah. A soccer player was tripped and, and broke his leg during a soccer game. There's, you know, that, that we have insurance for that. So, I mean, like, the like, um, created a hazard, though. I mean, the insurance try to get out of it if they're like, I don't think so. Accidents happen, but if you, if you create hazards, I don't think so. Yeah. That's not to say it shouldn't be fixed. <laughs> if we have, yes. if we are aware yes. of a problem that could hurt a student, I think we should fix it. Yes. I agree. <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> I know you do. I just feel like that needs yeah. to be said. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it does need to be said. Can you remind me right. when um, PCB testing is scheduled to happen at RBS? It just changed. So hold on one second. Let me, it's in my calendar. I'm not going to show the whole world my calendar <laughs> simply because I don't want to stress people out. Well, that's not, it's really does not look that Not this yeah. part, no. <laughs> I believe it's June sometime. Sorry, this year or next year? This year. June, she said June. So the, no, I'm sorry. So the the testing begins at, at, at MHS, like the pre-work begins over April break. And then over July, the week of July 1st is when the testing actually happens here at, in, in this school. building. And then continues for the next week. And the next week, and the next week. So this summer. Yes. This so summer. July here for this building. Maybe maybe that's what I was mixing up when I was looking at it. Is the two RVS might still be next year. And remind me, we talked about this last week. If the state removes the mandate to test this session, then we don't test. Depends on what they rule if we've started in April and they make legislation in beginning of June. I don't know how that works with that yeah. process. If they say anybody who's already started the process continues it. So that means that MHS would still be tested, but RBS would not be. Or if they say we're just ending it yeah. right now. I don't know how they would write that legislation. Yeah, and, and let's let's be very clear that if this building is tested and there are PCBs at any sort of actionable level, this community is going to demand we fix it, yep. and they should. Yep. Sorry, Red. I must have been confusing the uh, the second date for MHS, thinking that it was RVS. Just putting it quickly in my calendar because I'm in December and I don't see the RVS dates yet. So it must be later on next year for RBS that because of the, they did it based on the date of the build of the building or work done in the building. And because of when RBS was built and then renovated, it was not in a significant time of PCBs, which is why it was pushed to the back. Cause there's, they don't believe that they're, they'll find anything there. Is that the state of consultants? <laughs> That's an excellent question, Rhett, that I am not going to answer because I don't know. <laughs> Jim, can you remind us when the facilities report is due? Don't we have like a currently underway? June, correct? The, they were supposed to do an update in March, but I canceled it based on what? Because we have things going on. Yeah, because we have things going on. So it's it's end of May. Okay. And I just found the date. It's uh it starts the the pre testing is uh starts uh April twenty two thousand twenty five. For RBS. For RBS. Yeah.
further further questions? Have we? So I guess just kind of getting to the RBS idea. Have we sought and received a legal opinion on the process that we're undertaking right now and known and unknown legal and financial risks of that course of action? We have spoken with the Agency of Education regarding it. So from that piece, we have, I have not consulted with Pietro Lynn, our attorney, or attorney around this. Sometimes it feels like I spend eternity with him. Um, <laughs> no, I haven't, I haven't asked him specifically. I'm sort of sort of trying to identify what those are. I mean, that's the one thing that I've been struggling with here. I mean, one of many things that I'm sure many people are struggling with are the <clears throat> sort of so in the past couple couple of weeks, you know, I've talked to a lot of people, learned a lot about thoughts about the merger, you know, what the agreement says, read the agreement. Um, and in some ways you can read it and it seems so simple, right? <laughs> like the board can um, change course with the majority vote. Um, but then I kind of step back and think, you know, to do that in two weeks, sort of soup to nuts, um, boy, there seems like a lot we could be missing. Um, I really do worry about those ideas. And, you know, I've heard a lot of calls for you know, being fiscally responsible and, and those have resonated with me. And, um, and so like without having a sense of, you know, where, where those risks and landmines that I can't envision because I'm not an expert in this space might reside. Uh, I do struggle with, a uh, um, with a two week turnaround to consummate this idea. So, so I, the agency of education would have been able to name some for us. Um, and we asked them to check into things like federal grant money. How does that influence our federal grant money? It doesn't, um, the money would just be, be transferred um, to union, essentially. Union doesn't receive Title I dollars right now. And the reason why union did receive Title I dollars prior to the merger, um, it lost the Title I dollars because of the merger, because it was now compared to another elementary school. So Roxbury received the Title I dollars, Union did not. So if, you, if Roxbury were closed, then the Title I dollars would return to, yes. to Union. Um, so there's that piece in terms of federal dollars. Title I is? Title I is for intervention services, um, primarily. We use it for a lot of our intervention staffing. Um, so we talked to them about that ramification. Um, we've talked to them about just any kind. We've talked to them about pre-K because we had to for closing a pre-K program and kind of closing that loop with the agency of education around pre-K because um, the board had already decided to rip the pre-K position at Roxbury because of low numbers, low enrollment. So we've talked to them about that piece. Um, other than that, it's a matter of where the board decides to educate the children. So there, there are very few other loopholes there. Now that their facilities needs and desires and ensuring that our facilities stay up to date and taken care of at a building that the district owns and that will happen. Um, so I did talk to the lawyers around the question you were talking about. They did not raise any other questions for me of, hey, have you thought about this? Um, so I'm not as concerned about, about things, landmines, as you said, that we might need to know about because every person that we've talked to thus far who have not been our attorney, granted, um, has given us any. And I can say that, you know, Pietro's firm, if, if they got a whiff that we were doing something that might trigger something, they wouldn't wait for us to ask a specific question. They would say, if you guys looked ahead around the corner, they're, they're very good. So Tim, I, um, the, the pace 
at which change has happened is also something that sits uneasy with me. Um, I, well, yeah, it is. Problems, yeah. Um, I spent a lot of time doing work around community engagement. Um, the reason why I joined the board was because I felt like we needed to do a better job of engaging the community. Um, and yeah, I just, I just, the thought of making such a consequential decision with basically other than open um, forums like this and the 250 emails that we've gotten in the last couple of weeks, um, we haven't had a truly community engaged process. Um, when we had our, our audit on our special ed um, services, I think the lowest grade we got was in community engagement. Um, and so, yeah, I, I just, that's the piece that, that, it, that I'm struggling with the most here is that the decision is essentially being made without um, deliberate outreach to the community, without voices from students and teachers and taxpayers and administrators and then thoughtfully synthesizing that and then reporting it back to the board like we said we were going to do. Um, and I understand why the process has moved that quickly. And it, yeah, I just, I had to, to share that, that I know a lot of us, because I've had a lot of conversations, are uneasy with the pace. Um, and I think it's worth saying that it's not what we had intended on doing. I just... I'm sorry, I just want to interject and make sure that we're clear that no decision here has been made, that we are still in a space of deliberation and a vote nor a budget has been advanced. I feel like there's a little postmortem sort of toned discussion and I just want to be clear and I and not to take away Scott because I'm very much aligned with you and that I think um, inherently something that has been lacking or is lacking here. Um, we are in a very unfortunate um, situation, but certainly something that um, has not been able to be built into the process uh, or timeline of two weeks is a, a, a really focused, intentional, thoughtful community engagement process, um, which I think I said last week is also has been articulated as one of our top three goals uh, of the board. And at our first opportunity to do so, um, we're not doing. Um, so I, I, I am in sync with you on, on that as well. And again, you know, I think we haven't done the analysis on where Roxbury students are um, to be best educated. Um, and I don't think uh, we, we haven't done the analysis on how be best to utilize the RVS building into the future. Um, does it remain with the district? What potential added value could it um, could it offer to the district? Um, and I don't think we've done an analysis to really truly understand the benefits, costs, and opportunities of um, of such a decision. And uh, that's deeply concerning for me. And it, it does feel like a, <clears throat> a a big departure from this board's approach um, to due diligence um, and really thorough, thoughtful process. Um, so it, and, and I understand that we are, we are in unforeseen territory. Um, but when I'm also seeing, you know, a budget, you know, two budgets presented where there's a 2% difference, I'm, I'm certainly scratching my head as to why we would move forward with the closure of the school uh, with such, uh, and, and maybe, Montpelier board members feel that you know a two percent difference is the difference between a budget will that will pass and a budget that will not. Um, but I, I'm I'm deeply concerned that we haven't done the community engagement or the the bigger analysis process. And I also I'm sorry just while I'm on my diatribe I'm going to add I am concerned about the harm to the partnership. Uh, we are hearing about families that may choose to homeschool should RVS, uh, current RVS students be moved to UES next year. Um, we're hearing about families that may opt to tuition their uh, students into other neighboring districts, um, which I feel is further fracturing and up to our community. Uh, it's harmful. I think we're better all in this together moving forward into this transition. We have a larger support system, and I think we can better accomplish that if we um, if we give ourselves a year to really do the diligence and do the work um, that I think we should.
to Kristen's point, if the number of students don't from Roxbury don't materialize in Montpelier, how does that impact the savings numbers in on slide um, um, slide five? So, for example, we have there's 42. Is that what? So, 10 percent, 20 percent. I have no idea. I haven't done that okay. calculation, and I couldn't do that calculation because it's an added. It's a it's a computation thing that the state gives us what each student is worth as a per pupil weight. It's not one kid, this amount of money. It's a per pupil weight based on identifying factors. And that is given to us by the agency of education. That is not something that we compute ourselves. Understood, but we could compute if some weights, some number of weights didn't materialize as expected, that would clearly have a budgetary impact. And I guess what I'm trying to understand, is there like a sensitivity analysis that tells us, you know, if a certain number, because we're projecting on this one, um, the closure scenario somewhere north of a million, I think. Um, and I guess I'm just wanting, particularly with what Kristen was just talking about, wanting to understand what our risk is that we, realize I, I that I couldn't tell you because I can't tell you how many people would leave I think even if you had a long drawn, long drawn out process I think people would consider leaving or threaten to leave I, I think that could be inevitable so um and decide to close the school I don't think that that is indicative of one decision now or later I think that that could happen regardless and I have not done that calculation as if all 42 students at Roxbury did not choose to come to Montpelier and chose to leave the district. I think that's an unrealistic reality. I just, I just don't think it would happen. Um, and so I haven't done that analysis, nor could I, I don't think. Um, I have another question. Don't go for it, Lynn. Uh, um, on slide five, Libby, in the green box, you have um, uh, to keep an additional bus to help with transportation challenges. Is that um, Kristen brought up the um, the issue last time of the East Roxbury and West Roxbury bus? I'd have to talk to our bus that. our bus company as to how they would use two buses in Roxbury. So right now efficient. there's one. Is that there's a Roxbury Village School bus that picks up the elementary school students, and there's a middle high school bus. So is that comes to Montpelier. Okay, so this is no change in right. improving the busing situation. No, there's no, that's not accurate because if the village school bus would not be going to the village school, or would be they would be doing a different bus run. Okay. You could use those buses differently in Roxbury. So just following up on that, kind of built into the budget already is a potential up to 200,000 for an after-school care at, at RBS. This is the scenario with busing RBS students to UES next year, the additional bus. So those would be transition costs. Mm -hmm. um, What if we unencumbered part of the track money and moved like another 150,000 in for potential use by some sort of potential use during the transition for unanticipated costs of the transition? It wouldn't influence the budget at all, really, because you're not, you would just encumber it and then we'd use it as we would, but you wouldn't be influencing the tax rate in any way. Okay. Because you don't know what, and, and that would still leave adequate money for the track. To I believe potential so. adequate money for the track. People say, <laughs> and we do still have some. You know, if some of that money is unused, or we could do move some reserve fund money mm -hmm. back into the track. If say we have to go to the next. Yep. Yeah. Um, I recall in the MRESSA, but. Um, negotiations there was an attempt to add driving 
into the IA language of the contract. Instructional assistance already do driving. So that's so that's in there. Yes. Has um has it ever has has the district ever considered purchasing a van? We have four vans. Oh, so then you have. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, we have. We have four of them. Sorry. <laughs> um, because I I just buses are big and unreliable and vans are small and IAs are already contractually sort of potentially able to drive or I don't know if it would have to be a different position completely. Now, again, we're going down into very big rabbit holes because contractual hours are 730 to three for instructional assistance. So if that's not what this would be like. We're going down a rabbit hole of detail. Yeah, I know that, that's so hard um, to not slide into it. I know. Yes. And I would just be speaking but, through conjecture yeah. more than anything. There are lots of things that would have to be worked out in order for that to happen. <clears throat> right. I just want to respond to Jim's point. About Can you track. talk a little louder? Huh? Oh, yeah. I just want to respond to Jim's point about the track real quick. I feel that this is not the venue to dig up the track conversation again. Both myself and my amazing track coach who's here, who practice starts next week. Super excited. Both of us can give the testimony just like we've done many times before about what could be cut, um, about what the needs are, um, about the real impacts that our track program has. But I feel like we've had the conversation. Um, and I think that what we decided was that 400,000 was the amount needed to make our track functional. There wasn't luxury included in that number. Um, it's the amount that will allow us to appropriately serve the 80 or 90 and growing student athletes who access that program. Uh, I think I think Libby has presented us with two excellent proposals that we ought to talk about directly. The track, we've had that conversation. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the legislature needs you. <laughs> we need you too. This, um, this is not intended to be a continued um, busing rabbit hole, but I do wonder, uh, you know, if if you know, if the majority of the board, we're going to move forward with a budget that does not include uh, students at RVS next year, just in terms of the allocated, uh, like maintaining the bus at a value of whatever it was, 70, 72, if, if there could be a process <clears throat> inclusion of the community in thinking through um, kind of the best use of the bus. I know STA is our, is our bus company partner. Um, I also know that there has been pretty intense frustration and dissatisfaction with the bus service in Roxbury, um, specifically the MR1 route um, lateness. Uh, I've heard two accounts, not totally uh, nailed down, but I've heard two accounts this week of MR1 potentially uh, making a pickup in another location and changing the bus route, the bus being late for school because of that students uh, not getting breakfast. So again, these could be rumors. I've heard two accounts of it, but I think it continues to show that there is a fair amount of mayhem happening with uh, the with the MR1 bus route. And I think that the, the Roxbury community is really, really eager to partner with the district and STA to arrive at a at a, a bus route and, and schedule opportunities that really work and work for and serve the community. Um, so I would just request that if we get that additional bus that we get community input um, and that there's community collaboration around that. If there was a, um, if it did need to be a position, would that be something that could be added after a budget was passed? Sure, you could for us on that. Would there be any sense in including it before the budget is passed? Or the, the, the the finances for it, whether or not it pans out, but I don't know. You certainly can. 
<clears throat> to me, it seems like we have money in that scenario for two buses and it can be, the details can be figured out later about how to use that money. Maybe it's one bus and then some other kind of thing. Maybe it is the two buses, but I think the details, the money's there and maybe it's not exactly as much as we would need given there's the potential for a creative scenario nobody's thought of yet, but it's pretty close. If there's enough for two buses in that scenario, I think we've probably got it covered. I know oh. Cliff, you don't want yeah, to jump off of it. Questions or? Jill? Yeah. yeah. We, we talk as long as we want. Okay. Um, I'll be can we? Well, <laughs> I got the coffee else. chairs for us, Jim, but <laughs> there's a limit. <laughs> um, I, I'll try to be quick. Um, I just really feel compelled to defend the fact that regardless of where this goes tonight, every school board member does not want to be in this position. Every school board member wants to have more time and every school board member absolutely cares about every staff member and student in this district. And I felt like I needed to say that because regardless of how this goes, I'm not okay with having two weeks either. The community engagement is the voters voted our budget down and we have a timeline that's ticking and it is not of our doing or choice. Sometimes we have to do the hard work and that stinks because we worked really hard on a really good budget. And this is an amazing district and I'm very proud to be here. All of us on this board care deeply about our community, every single person in it. We are committed to providing our students with the best possible outcomes. We're holding space for and are being held accountable by you, all our constituents in both towns. The reality, unfortunately, is that we are in this position due to many factors that are outside of our control where the cost of educating students in Vermont does not align with Vermonters' ability to pay for it. Over the years, the cost of educating students has continued to climb. Our student enrollment numbers as a state are drastically down from their peak in the late 90s when the Brigham decision passed. Our housing crisis means people who want to live in Vermont must have the financial means to do so or make significant sacrifices in order to move here and stay here. The cost of special education, healthcare, supports for families like food and childcare has only climbed what we are asking of our schools as a society has only increased and these things cost money. Perversely, Vermont is very generous with property tax credits and subsidizing keeping people in their homes indefinitely. And what this means, in addition to making Vermont a lovely place to live for some folks, also means that the next generation of taxpayers cannot move here, buy a home, pay full taxes and send their kids to our schools. Vermont prides itself on policies that preserve our natural landscape, but that means we don't build any new houses we hand out exemptions to things that keep Vermont looking like Vermont, and therefore the property tax burden continues to shift even further onto the backs of the shrinking workforce of Vermonters who actually pay rent, buy homes, and pay taxes. Over the years, the legislature has messed with the funding streams for the education fund to continue to try to shore it up. They've made property tax adjustments. They've added purchase and use, which is sales tax, to the education fund. They've added meals and rooms tax money to the education fund, lottery funds, and so on. Also, all of those things which are paid by all of us Vermonters. <laughs> Our city council recently discussed creating a TIF, which is a tax increment finance district to pay for the country club property infrastructure. Guess what TIFs do? They increase the grand list and they siphon that money from the education payment back to pay back that loan for the infrastructure. So we're out of money and we're out of options. And unfortunately, I'm sorry to say the legislature is not coming to a rescue. They've shaken every mattress. They are not finding money anywhere without adding taxes to somebody in Vermont. Um, actually, frankly, they're hearing a lot right now that education spending is too high. Education spending is too high, and that's the problem. They're not seeing that they have continued to sort of narrow and narrow and narrow the backs on which this is being paid for. So all this to say, I think we've reached the inevitable conclusion that was sealed in place the moment Act 46 passed. And by the way, the voters in both districts voted yes to approve the merger. I am heartbroken for Rocks Ferry. I am moved and I am forever impacted by this discussion. I have no business telling this community whether they can keep their school or not. As Jake said last week, the legislature and the administration did not have the political will to force small schools to close. So they passed Act 46 and left the hard work to school boards around the state, creating what feels like an incredibly contentious and unfortunate and unnecessary conversation and discussion and discourse that we've had to go through for this. And as one of the community members said in our many letters that we've gotten, it, since Act 46 passed, it's actually a pretty impressive feat that we were able to keep Roxbury open as long as we did. So 
I know my heart. I know this community and I love this community and I absolutely care deeply for every single student, educator, parent, taxpayer in this community. I don't need anyone to tell me that I need to open my heart more. I know sitting here, because I do feel like my empathy and my moral compass and that of everybody on this board is intact, I have no choice on behalf of all of the residents of Montpelier and Roxbury to support a budget that buses Roxbury students to Union Elementary School starting this fall. Thank you. That's pretty well said. Thank you. Are you said, making a motion? Yeah. I'm not sure what our motion is. Are we approving a budget number? I think no, we're first vote is yeah. I think we're first. She is doing a terrible job <laughs> I don't and brought a dead computer. So I have literally. I, I, I there's no motion. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure if this uh, is really going to help you, but no. Uh, the the structure of is to entertain a motion to. Um, move students who attend Roxbury Village School uh, in FY25 or XY26. And it sounds like from the discussion that we will probably go with FY25 to Union Elementary School is motion one. And that motion two is the budget. And I think we have done that. I know that one of the, the you know, the, the budget seems to, to do that itself, but uh, we have done that to to separate the the two questions um and uh i think also perhaps give some room for some members to to vote one way on one and one way on the other if they so choose. Sure. did we make any adjustments to the budget based on the questions folks were asking i didn't know if some of those were unresolved yet about moving I, things around in terms of the number I think that's another reason to have these as two different votes. Yeah. Because we need to make a decision on where to educate the, the, the elementary school students of Roxbury. And then we need to make a decision about what the budget looks like because the budget could go even lower than what Libby has presented to us in I, various different ways. Mm -hmm. Guys, a question about the motion so and we're emailing about this but the um sort of the you know folks can request a waiver uh to attend a different school based on you know geographical convenience i'm unclear about this motion is that predetermining those questions that may come to us in a future meeting where someone seeks a waiver or to tuition elsewhere i don't think so i mean i i I, I think that's, that's a way for the could, yeah. I think that's something that could be you know at, at any time. I think anybody could just, make that. Yeah, anybody could, yeah. could petition the board for that. But we wouldn't come back and say that's been dealt with over here. We would entertain that on its merits. Yes. Okay. Just wanted to make sure that was clear. I mean, I do want to say that in the past, such waivers have been generally. I mean, there there were a, there's been a few in my close to ten years on the board, and they were all. They're all denied. Understood. Uh, I'm understand. sorry, they were all they're all denied. 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 Yeah. Is is there some criteria for determining what what the reasons for which waivers would be granted? There is it. Most of them, most of them came the, the ones that I did the ones that I was on the board for came after the the merger, if you recall. Uh, at the time of the merger, um, the Roxbury students that were seven through 12 were tuitioned into, you know, as, as was brought up earlier, mostly U32. Some, and, and then anyone who was still at, at Roxbury at that date did not, what we did was we allowed the people who were already at, at a different school to finish. Right. But people who were at RBS uh, at the date of the, 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 the date the merger was approved, came to, to M, MHS or MSMS. And, there were some families that asked for a sibling to follow their older sibling to U32 or one of the schools. And, and, we said, and, and to be tuitioned by the district to do that. So 
but that's that's the only experience I've had with it. But I don't think we have criteria or all. I mean, we could put one in place, but we don't have one now. So I think uh, I'll just oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll just say for my end, and I'm not going to say it as well as <laughs> as Jill, um, and agree with you know everything you said about the good place that this conversation is coming from from everybody. Um, I think I'll have I think I'll have to vote no on that first one, just given the fact that we haven't done our due diligence on it and that we can. So we're sort of choosing not to because that can, I mean, you don't have to have a lengthy process to have someone advise uh, and run reasonable scenarios on legal and financial risks. These are unknowable in totality, but one can know them better by going through the process. And while, you know, I will confess at the time of the merger, I remember speaking with my neighbor a lot about it and I was, I was not for it, um, but we're in it. We're all one team and I can't, whether or not there's a legal right to do this, that, or the other thing. I can't imagine that a two week process. I mean, I can't imagine that that was ever contemplated as the way we would make such a weighty decision. Um, and a two week process that frankly, like I, I think these scenarios that were presented today are really helpful. I think the ones we had before really kind of, you know, a lot of the feedback I heard was based on this fear of, you know, really intense cuts to Montpelier. And so, you know, I reflect on, on those choices and how we funneled the conversation in that way to get to this place. And, you know, no one's going to do anything perfectly. And, and Libya, I give you all the credit in the world for taking stabs at this stuff because it's hard, you know, like to be the one stuck putting something on a page for us all to react to. Like that is not an easy or enviable task. So I really... I really want to credit that, but I, I do think some of the inadvertent effect channeled this conversation that I'm not sure how helpful it was um, to the ultimate decision and where I wish we had focused our energy was, you know, just making sure that if we were going to go down a particular road, we were really cognizant of what our legal and financial risks are and that when we go forward, we really make a commitment to make space for, you know, if this vote goes the way I think it might, for um, Roxbury to kind of envision what, how it, you know, experiences education in MRPS. Um, and that might mean some things that aren't present now. And I hope that we have the budget for it and we, we really make a commitment to that. So, but again, appreciate everyone. And I, also appreciate being the new guy, everyone answering all my questions and taking time to meet with me. That goes for board members and kind people in the community who took time to meet with me as well. Very much appreciate it. Can I ask you, Jim, because you're the sole board member on the merger committee? Yes. Um, so I'm going to put you on the spot a yes. little bit because I was not here at the time for this. That I would imagine because because the Roxbury Village School closed two grade levels. No, yeah, two, two grade, grade levels, levels yeah. five and six, yep. and, or, and started sending them to Main Street Middle School the year 2018. I would imagine any kind of legal or fiscal conversations were part of that very detailed process. I can't think of any, that doesn't mean there aren't any, but I can't think of any. Were there any as part of that detailed process that was put forth with a lawyer's contribution? Because they closed I, two grade levels, right? Yeah, they did. I, I do not recall any. Uh, yeah. And in the merger agreement, there is a letter from Pietro signing off on this process as well. And the merger agreement yes. as legal, as a legal, yeah. legally binding document. Yeah, which, which had, which had the closure process or the transfer process. In it. Yeah. If there's a closure. There's a, well, there's a process. There's a process to, yeah, the, the, it's it's board discretion. 
Exactly. That's it. Well, there was a time frame of a minimum of four years. Four years, yeah. Which is I wasn't a yeah. but I read it too. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I think I'm talking I mean, about more specific issues that are present. I mean, my right. my concerns about closure, and I, I, I think it's, it's fair to say that we have heard from educators very close to this that, that this quote-unquote transition year, given the staffing situation at that school, could very well lead to a situation where it would be very hard to staff that school or to staff it in a way that would give the type of education that students would want to have. And I think that's part of, of my process as well. I mean, my, my biggest regret with moving students at the rapidity that we're, we're doing it has to do with, you know, just the, you know, the, the quickness of it, the, um, you know, the seeming quickness of it. And, and also, you know, I mean, I feel that I, I wish we had spent the five years, six years we've had, um, I wish it started three or four years ago when we had time and money thinking about was there ways we could change the structure of that school to make it a magnet school or something that would be sustainable and creative. Um, I mm -hmm. think, unfortunately, we're we're out of that time and money. And if we do move students to RVS or from RVS to UES at the end of this year, I think we need we need to deal with that sadness and that hurt and that lost opportunity. But I also think we need to see this as a coming together of communities. We have to open our arms and our hearts to those students when they come to UES, to those families. Um, we have to do all we can between now and August to make sure that when those students arrive at UES, um, they arrive in a way where they are, they're going to thrive and they're going to love it. And I think that's how we continue to be one district, one community, um, you know, we, we, we can't change all the factors that Jill talked about that really collapsed upon us avalanche style. Um, but we can be very, we can be as thoughtful and as kind moving forward to make this work with the situation we have as we need to be. And, and I think we all need to, you know, when we come out of here tonight, uh, we all need to come together and come together fast uh, to make this work in the fall so that the kids are getting an awesome experience and they're getting the love and education they need. Hello? I just have something very short and sweet to say. Um, surrounding like the stress transporting like Roxbury students here. Um, there are students here who wake up at five in the morning. There are students at this school in the middle school and at the elementary school who show up to school anxious and hungry and sleep deprived. And there are so many amazing resources for those students. I have used those resources. My friends have used those resources. And I think I'm, I'm confident that they will be available to Roxbury students once they come here too. And it, it's just, it will help them out. It will be a great environment for them. And those teachers and resources have helped me. So I know they will help those students. I guess for the purposes of the conversation, I'll make a motion that we bus Roxbury students to Union Elementary for the 2024-2025 school year. Do I have a second? I'll second that. I was going to say. Any further discussion? Can I make an amendment? You can offer one. Or you can it. discuss. Yes. I want to offer an amendment. You know. Um, in that case, the I'm trying to get to the charge document for the RVS committee would make no sense because I believe the language was whether or not we would do 
what we are, would be voting on. And so it makes no sense to have a committee that's formed to make a recommendation to the board to do what the board has already decided. Um, and so I think we did put an agenda I don't know after this to talk about the committee and we can read we can redo the charge if we need to then. okay if, you're, if your amendment is going to redo the charge we do have an opportunity I gotcha okay. I missed that yes yes um so I seconded Jill's motion to bring RVS students to UES this year um and and I agree that it's happening very quickly um and I apologize for that. Um, I think that in my mind, um, we've heard a lot of good cases, a lot of good reasons for why the school should stay, why RVS should have an elementary school long-term. You know, the three of you have made great cases for that. Um, and I wish that I knew a way to help make that happen. Um, but I don't know a, a way to do that. I've worked for the state for 10 years. Um, during my first six, seven, eight years, it used to be that um, a lot of legislators would say, you know, oh, we need to spend the money on education because it's the children's future. This year is different. Um, they are frustrated with spending. Um, I don't see any formula changes coming that are gonna be beneficial to our district. And I also don't see good news on the horizon for small small schools that cost a lot for people. And I'm, I'm just wanna be honest with you there. Um, so the question in my mind has come to, is it better to do it this year or to wait a year? I think waiting a year would be really hard. It would be a hard year for Roxbury Village. Um, I think this year is also gonna be hard, but there's gonna be some um, positives, um, especially with staff um, coming into Montpelier. So, um, you know, I don't, um, it, it's, it's, it's super hard. Um, you know, everything that Jill said is, is how I feel basically, um, but um, that's, that's where I'm at. I'm also going to vote no, uh, uh, or vote yes. I want to make sure I think I'm going to skip that. Because um, <laughs> we've got so many proposals out there, I'm not sure what I'm voting on anymore. But my position is um, that I think the kids from Roxbury would get a great education here. Um, there have been a lot of problems with the busing out there, and I'm hoping that if they come here, if that's what the vote of the board is, that um, we can deal with some of those issues and make things better. I know you have concerns about the school being the center of your community. I think having an after school program there would be helpful. I have some serious concerns about staffing. Um, we've had trouble filling positions there, trouble keeping positions there. We're getting late in the season here. Teachers, you know, are out there looking for where they want to be now. Um, and it would be really terrible if the school began, couldn't begin because there weren't teachers there. Um, and the last thing is I have concerns about using a ton of the fund balance because it's there to bail us out of emergencies and to kind of keep things functioning that, um, relate to the buildings and other things. So those are my concerns. Yeah, I'm also, I'm also gonna vote yes. Um, and I do so very reluctantly, but I think for a lot of the reasons raised, um, I think kind of speaking to Jake, I mean, when the, the merger came together, I was on the merger committee and I was, I was a supporter of the merger. And I, I think it's been beneficial for both towns. And I also knew when it happened that this day may come and it was, it was my fear that it would come in this way because we knew that the, the model, there's a reason that Vermont had many, many schools the size of Roxbury Village School when I was born a long time ago. And now there's really only three or four about the size of Roxbury Village School. 
Uh, and it's because it's, it's education has changed and it's a model that's changing. And, and I think we, we knew at the time of the merger, again, that, that, you know, this, this day w may come. Um, I mean, it was, it was my hope. And I think my biggest, biggest regret over the last four or five years is that we didn't start a conversation sooner to see if, if there was a way to, to change the model of Roxbury Village School and, and keep it, you know, keep it something that, that could be sustained as a, a real center of, of education with, you know, students in it, you know, full day. Uh, and not that it can't still have some sort of, of use around students and kids, but as a K through four school, um, you know, I don't think that's sustainable and we haven't come up with that model, unfortunately. And, and now, you know, as, as Jay kind of said, you know, because of further changes at the state level, we were, were out of time and money. Um, and if there was a path forward that was longer than a year, it would be different. But I really take to heart, I, I'm married to an educator. I trust this educator next to me. I trust a lot of the educator, other educators I've talked to uh, and the strong consensus of pretty much all of them has been that trying to, you know, I, I don't want to put words, well, a, a letter sent to us from an educator very close to the school said schools are about growth. And when a school is no longer about growth, it becomes very hard to have the type of environment that you want to raise kids in or educate kids in. And um, I think because of that, I think it's, and I also have concerns about the fund balance and, um, you know, what we may need that for, uh, you know, spending the fund balance and then getting it to test back in July that we have a problem at the high school. As I said, this community is not going to send kids to a high school with actionable PCB levels. Um, that this is the hard decision to make. And that's, you know, and I think, again, uh, I think the focus after this vote, if, if the yes is carry, is let's make this as, as wonderful a transition as we can for these kids. Um, and let's be kid first. And let's make sure that they come into UES with open arms and open hearts. And you know, within a few weeks, they're running around on the playground with new friends and having a wonderful experience. And if that happens, um, I think that'll heal a lot of the hurt. Maria? Yeah. I can't vote. Um, <laughs> but, but I support this motion, and I support it for three reasons. Uh, the first one is to decrease the tax burden on all the taxpayers of this district. Uh, the second one is to provide the best possible education to Roxbury Elementary Schoolers. And the third one is to pass a fiscally responsible budget that allows us to have the fund balance available for its intended purpose, which is to be prepared for whatever comes, comes next. In the past couple of years of my life, there's been a flood and a pandemic and things keep burning down. Um, <laughs> I don't know what's going to come next and I want the district to be prepared for it. And I really truly regret that we're in this situation and I hope we can make the transition as best as possible for every student in this district. Jill, I really appreciate you bringing in so much of the bigger picture context here. I, I, um, I last week asked Libby to try and come up with a scenario that would maybe help us have that one more year or whatever we needed in order to be able to make a really thoughtful and thorough decision. And I feel like I, I've looked at could we do that? No. Could we do that? No. Could we do that? Like, I really, really wanted to find a way. And um, I just don't see one. I'm really sorry. I understand that. Yeah. I can do the math. Thank you. And I, I don't think it's possible. And while I have a 
great deal of appreciation for everyone that I serve with on this board. And I agree with you, Jill. I think we have an incredible amount of compassion and thoughtfulness. I do also feel some frustration with us because this is the second time in my only three and a half years of sitting on this board where we have found ourselves in a position where we have had a very big decision to make and we have not done a deliberative process. And I get it. I get why we are in this position today because we kept getting walloped from many different directions. Um, every, people have said them already. I don't need to reiterate them. But we are meant to be a deliberative body and we are not doing that right now. And I fully respect, have a great deal of respect for every single person who's shown up meeting after meeting, or maybe this is your first meeting. Thank you for being here. Thank you for writing to us. The people who write to us and show up and give public comment have the somewhat luxury of feeling settled in the opinion that they have and the decision that they made. We are here to receive all of those opinions, to sort through them, to ask tough questions, and we are not doing that. And that makes me really disappointed in us. And it makes me, it makes this decision even harder because we haven't actually thought it through to the level that I think it deserves. And yet here we are. I'd like to add to that, if I can. Is it okay for me to speak? Don't of cut anything. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank all of you. Um, thank you, Mia. Thank you. It's a really, really difficult moment as I'm kind of listening and I'm doing the math and I have a sense of how this is is stacking up. And I appreciate what Jake said. Um, there is going to be immense, and there already is immense pressure on small schools in the state. Um, and I, I stand with you, um, Mia and Jim, in terms of having regret about not having acted sooner uh, in a more proactive way. I think we do find ourselves in a really reactive situation. Um, I can recall one of my earliest meetings in July of 2021. I think Libby did try to center this question for the board, um, and we did not take the bait. <laughs> uh, and... Um, I think that we owe it to ourselves if we are strong and good leaders and we are planning to continue to do this work on behalf of our communities to have a reflection process on this such that, you know, I think if, if this is going the way it seems to be and the yeses do prevail, um, I have a sense that this is going to be a canary in the coal mine situation and we are um, a, an indicator of what may be to come for other districts with small schools. Um, and I certainly would put my, you know, name in the hat, uh, or sorry, name in the ring to, um, support other districts should they want to reach out to us that we can show kind of our reflection. What, what do we wish we would, we had done differently? What do we wish we had seen? What flags were up that we maybe did not acknowledge to the extent that we should have, um, and be prepared to support other districts that may be facing incredibly hard, impossible decisions. Um, so I'd just like to put that out there, that an exercise of like reflection for this board, I think is is in order. Um, and I, I deeply appreciate the conflict and the, the torture that this has felt like for everybody. And I appreciate my fellow board members. And I want to give a huge shout out to my community, to Roxbury and the way that community members have organized and the passion and the heart and the strategy and the way that they have come out for their community, for their kids who we all love beyond. Um, and I think for our community, a silver lining has been that we have discovered who we are and what we are made of. And um, I am in incredibly proud of, of Roxbury and being a resident of Roxbury. Um, and I just, my gratitude to, to all of you and to all of our beloved teachers at the Roxbury Village School. And um, this has just been incredibly hard. Um, so I think Libby, you cited 250 emails we've received over, over the last couple of months in this process. 
Um, I think I looked just over the last week, uh, we had over a hundred emails. Um, I just, yeah, I was just really struck by the the overwhelming majority of, of the communication that, that we were getting um, showed how thoughtful and compassionate um, our community members are, um, that included parents and teachers and students and administrators and local officials, both elected and non-elected. Um, and I, I'm not positive. I think I, I want to correct you, Jim. I think we as a board did respond to every single one of them because um, I know I tried to respond to every one of them. Um, and, and I see a lot of the faces in here who, who I um, recognize from those emails. Um, I even might have cut and pasted a couple of um, sentences from some of those emails um, for, for the sake of, um, of my own sanity. Um, and I just, I, I just wanna say thank you uh, to everybody for, for engaging in the process. Um, I, regardless of what you think of the outcome, the reality is that that the, this process has has damaged our our community because of the uncertainty that that you all have described. And so, regardless of of whether or not you agree, we need we need to pass a budget on April thirtieth. Um, and so, I just implore everyone to to um, to get anyone who possibly can to vote yes for, for the budget because we cannot continue to hurt our community with, a, with another failed budget vote. Let the record show I vote no in this motion. And I wanna to speak to, Miriam isn't here, but the idea that the best education available is at UES is, a, is an assumption and it is a matter of opinion. And there are three teachers at RBS who have experience at UES and they do not share in that opinion. And I just wanna name that because there are a lot of different things that work. Um, but there has been a lot of harm a lot of hurt and there's going to continue to be a lot of hurt there's heartbreak and there's going to have to be time for healing and there's going to have to be empathetic leadership and we're going to have to do a lot of work to make this as successful as we possibly can and in some ways that work starts now um, there's a lot of work that's been hard to do well there's this small school um, sort of out there, you know, I mean, the budget, the cost per pupil at UES went from 24,000 to 32,000 from last year to next year. That's a huge, huge, huge increase that I do not believe would be possible without RVS. And so not only RVS and the merger has protected the district from not being able to make their own decisions and potentially having the Board of Education forced Montpelier to accept another town. I think the cost per pupil at RBS has also allowed a great deal of investment in education that doesn't look so big because it's in comparison to the cost per pupil at RBS. That, that, that cost per pupil number per building has been used <laughs> very, very... Um, intentional <clears throat> and I don't know what to say about that because getting our kids the best education that we can possibly get is what we're all in this to do um, protecting our teachers the administration um, I don't have anything more to say this is a really really sad sad position to be in Thanks to you and Kristen for all you, you've taken on on behalf of your community. This has been hard several months for both of you. I know. Let's pass it back. 
Yeah. Uh, I just want to. Yeah, we have a, we have yeah. That's right now. Much like that. I just want to explain our quirky voting uh, because I'm not sure this is going to be unanimous. But sort of things are unanimous. Um, each Montpelier vote counts as two. Each Roxbury vote, Roxbury member vote counts as one. Because we are nine, we have the possibility of eight and eight. I don't think that's going to happen. We need nine total weighted votes to pass any measure if all people are at present. Least, at least nine. At least nine, yeah. The nine plus. Um, uh, it's with all people present. So. Uh, <laughs> Let's let's do rolls of yeas and nays because I think we're gonna. Uh, I think we're gonna have to do that anyways. Yeah. Um, I'll just go down, Jake. Um, would you please totally restate the motion? Restate, yeah. <laughs> um, the motion is to support a budget that buses Roxbury students to Union Elementary School for the 2024-2025 school year. Yes. 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 No. Kristen? No. Scott. He was a no. Scott was a no. Six, ten. Uh, motion passes ten to six. Good motion on the budget. Mm -hmm. Or motion first, or are we so motion first, and then talk about any amendments to the motion? Can I just say one more thing? Yes. Um, this is a little peek behind the curtain. Uh, before all of this, well, not all of it. <laughs> somewhere in the middle of all of it, um, Kristen and I reached out to another district that what had just recently voted to start a process to close the school. It was a little confusing, but we spoke to the board chair there and their district had been has been merged for 20 years. And I think it was three towns. And um, when they merged, the smallest of those towns closed their elementary school. Um, fun fact, it was small enough of a school that it was sold to someone to be their residence. And they used, the town used that money to um, invest in, uh, I think, a new community center. And the, um, the takeaway from that that she told us was that 20 years on, that little town had more town spirit and community ethos and heart than the other towns in their district that had remained, had the, their elementary schools had remained. I don't have a crystal ball, but I know that there are people in Roxbury and there are people in Montpelier who care very much about small towns. And I think that there is a path forward where Roxbury can have a wonderful, bright future, even without your elementary school. Well, I just have to say, and I know you don't want me to do it, but this was an additional financial burden on Roxbury because eventually we're going to have that building. And you might think it's a great place to have a community center, but the, at the cost of a couple hundred thousand dollars a year to run it, it's going to come out of my pocket, not yours. And, you know, so it's easy to say. That you, you, it's an opportunity for Roxbury. You're getting a building back for a dollar. We gave it to you for nothing. Just remember Thanks that. Thanks for letting me say that. Um, I also want to observe that by voting to send the elementary school students from Roxbury to Union, we're not technically closing the school. Right. The You're school right. is You're still right. a resource for the district as of right now. Yeah. I've heard Libby say before, it's a resource for the district. There hasn't been an intentional effort to try to determine alternative uses. Um, it's hard to do when you've got kids in classrooms. There are, there are, I don't know what the possibilities are, but I always remain optimistic in all things 
And in this case, I still have not given up hope that there are educational purposes that can be realized in that space. Maybe for older kids, CVCC is short of space. You know, now there's opportunities to sort of explore some of those ideas potentially. I wish I had some really, really great ones for you, but um, I'm, you know, to all of our alternative pathways folks, to all of the folks that work in this district, recognize for a moment that that space will be empty essentially, at least from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. And if there's anyone that comes up with any bright ideas to use that space to help enhance our students' educations, please, please share those ideas with the administration of the Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools. I think we can get the committee charge. Uh, that's going to be important part of it. Do you have a, any further comments, or do you have a budget motion that we have a discussion? Slide up on the screen, please. <laughs> Thank you. Dollar amount. Yeah, we would be. That's exactly. We're not taking second public comment, um, just because we've had, we've had, we've had a lot. So Libby, this one up here, just to clarify, does not include any fund balance. It includes four hundred seventy-five thousand. Right, includes, not the, anymore. The, it includes right. the fund balance that we passed originally. Yes. Thank yes. you. That's that's helpful. Um, but so if so, if we're going to make a motion and name that number on the on the screen, thirty million five hundred seventy-five four hundred fifteen, that's what would be warned, or that is including the four seventy-five from fund balance. That's our proposed budget. So what's warned is not the education spending, it's the general budget. Right, and is that, does that represent general budget or education? General budget. Okay. Okay. I wonder if before, or I guess if we're, if we're to talk about the number, do we wanna have the motion first or talk first? You could make the motion for the number that's on the screen and then have a discussion to lower it and then amend the motion once the board has had that discussion. Right? Yes. Yeah. 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 All right. I move that we warn a budget of $30,575,415 for the FY25 school year of the calendar. Do you have a second? Second. Second. All right. Discussion. Let's talk about it. Yeah. Um, well, I'll just um, give some context for why I made that motion, which is that um, you know we've we've basically heard the pleas to pass a budget that we think threads a very small eye of a very thin needle that. Um, will pass by being fiscally responsible and doesn't impact the um, educational outcomes that we want for our students. And um, uh, after uh, 30 weeks, how long has it been? <laughs> Libby and her team have right. definitely done the due diligence to find every nook and cranny of, our, of existing funds that we could do without um, in order to thread that needle. And um, I don't think at this point it's worth trying to take anything more from fund balance to try to bring down the tax rate. Um, and I certainly don't want to go make any deeper cuts than what we see here. So that's why I made the motion. Yeah. And I, I, I also support this budget as proposed. I mean, I do want to acknowledge and um, you know, the issue of, of moving Roxbury students to UES has been a big and painful one. I, I do want to acknowledge we are, even at 14%, we are making a big ask of, of taxpayers. That is, that's not a small number. And, um, 
we we do understand that the people out there are are being squeezed. Uh, that it's groceries are more expensive. <laughs> uh, this town just went through a lot of people lost a lot in the flood. Uh, people are. Yeah, this is this is a generous town that says yes to most things, and uh, I think we have hit some expense points that are making people feel uncertain about their ability to continue to afford to live here. And um, I, I just want to I just want to acknowledge that, and, and that does not mean that people are heartless or don't support kids or don't support schools, but um, people have budgets and realities about where their money goes, and it it can be. It can be hard to have increases that vastly outstrip inflation and, and what people are, are earning. So um, I, I support this, I think, for most of the reasons Mia said. I think it, it threads a needle, uh, given the realities we have in terms of uh, giving as excellent education as possible to all our kids uh, while um, asking, I think, the absolute most we really can of our taxpayers. Uh, but I, I want to acknowledge that even this number is, is not an easy one for a lot of, of family budgets and uh, other budgets. Deeply concerned that the bus company cannot do much to help with the transportation problems. And I wonder if there are alternative solutions that can be part of this budget. I don't know what they are, but the, what funding they might need I would, in, I would encourage the board to yeah. add to the budget, at least for some, enough small children to fit in a van. I don't know. Jim, you had mentioned a, I can't remember what you called it, a transition fund or something like that. And I know I, the the fund balance is in a really good place and i i think i don't know what the right amount is to set aside for transition which could be put towards the busing fixing the busing um challenges or some other need that comes out of a truly engaged community process community engaged process um and so i believe we're eventually going to get to the the committee um, but having having resources available to that committee to to address the concerns as they're raised i think will be important and so um yeah i, I don't know what the right amount is um but i do think some sort of transition fund available should be included yeah Concern whether or not that's fund or ongoing. Um, you know, one of the challenges with using fund, it's one time and then the next year, all the reasons folks had about fund that you set something up and and then the money's gone. And and so I you know, I think it was unanimous around here that there is a deep concern for how this transition goes. And I think it's critical that we fund that transition. And I also, as probably from my comments before, I am concerned about whether or not, both because it's a tight budget, really stripped down, and because I think there's some risk. Um, I would wonder if folks would consider adding some measure of conservatism. Um, I, I don't know what that right number is, whether or not that's a, a percent or something, but what I'm really concerned is that come back and we have, you know, we set ourselves up next year, like if we want to really kind of embrace this transition. So put that out there for thought. I'm not, and I'm just going to be clear, I'm going to support a budget. So it's like, I just, but I think it's a real legitimate question whether or not we focus on fund here or add some conservatism to the um, revenue we plan to generate. I'd love to hear what folks think about that. I don't know what you mean, Tim, by conservatism to the revenue we generate. What, is, what do you mean by or conservatism? To the amount, to the rate, right? Add, add a little on the assumption that there are going to be costs associated with this change. So put some money likely, back into the budget. Correct. Okay. Because 
conservative could mean cutting the budget. I just wanted to make Sorry. sure I understood yeah, what you meant. That was not my intent. Um, I mean, I think my thought on that is if we if we set aside some of the reserves, so the the committee can can have you know a, a source to fund ideas. You know, part of the thing with the transition is you learn things, right? Like some things are going to work, some things aren't. Um, I agree with you, like a one-time revenue source is going to have to be replaced. I think we can think about, if you know, we can, costs continue. if those costs continue, but I think one of the things we could learn is, is if we, you know, try some ideas because we don't have the runway we'd like to necessarily for this. I think by the time we're, we're starting to put next year's budget together, we're going to have a sense of what those costs are and what those costs are. So we can, we can put some of those costs into more of a continuing revenue stream. It's like, wow, you know, this idea really worked. This is you know seventy five thousand dollars extra. We're gonna gonna need to make sure the um, you know having Roxbury kids at UES works, or we you know we spent thirty thousand dollars on this one time thing and, and no one's using it. So are you agreeing with Tim that we should put more? No, I'm I'm, I'm saying I think we should I think we should should take a pot from the reserve. Yeah, and and use that and then kind of figure out which of those one-time expenditures look like they might need a budget line and which ones don't. And then we can we can have that information when we do next year's budget. I agree with that. I would not add to this tax rate in any way, shape or form. I would put it, I would I take it out of, I would expend or, or I would ask the board to um, put aside some fund balance. This budget needs well, to pass. And some and some things we don't have to set money aside for necessarily. Right. right. Just so that you have spent money from the fund right. balance for things like up until forty thousand dollars. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we don't have to make a decision tonight, I think is another thing I'm saying. Yes. About how much would come from the fund balance into a transition fund. Exactly. We can make decisions about what the transition needs and then come to the board and say. We would it like to be, use this much of the fund balance. It could be a recommendation from the credit. Right. Yeah. right. And I'm fine with that. I, yeah. I, I really, I think what I just wanted to rearticulate is what I hear as a, I think a unanimous commitment to really sort of putting our money where our mouth is on, on making this transition work. Yeah. I just want to say thank you, Tim, for for bringing that up. Um, and I do agree uh, that I think this feels like the work of the committee uh, that I think we need to kind of re uh, reimagine and and give a different scope uh, to, and I think it could be dealt with after the fact. And, and coming from the fund balance would make the most sense versus altering this budget. Have some thoughts about next year um basically and and it's late at night so maybe some other time but um i'm interested in is there another salary increase coming next year yes and do we know the percentage when you say next year next year FY 25 or 26 fy 26 well, so this we'll is negotiate FY 25. with the union next year Pardon? We'll negotiate with the union with two unions again next year. Start negotiations for FY26 or FY26. Okay. And then health insurance, there's nothing changing at the state level. So that's likely to be similar. Yes. Uh, and then earlier we were talking about the different bargaining units. And I'm sorry if this is over my head, but there were two of them that have Mar late March dates. And then one has an early February date. Dates for what? For uh, renewing contracts. So, so renewing contracts is something different okay. than the RIF notice. So renewing contracts that teachers have are mainly the ones that have the date, the IAs and the, the AFSCME. I'm not, I couldn't name the exact date off the top of my head. Um, do you know that at the top of your head? Yeah. yeah. Or Marissa's. Yeah. I, I just don't have that. I think that's more in later spring, but we have to get contracts out to teachers April 15th. 
And then another, who, who gets their contracts in February? Administrators. The administrators. Yeah. So, um, you know, I find it problematic that in the case of a rejected budget, that there is a group of employees who are essentially protected. Mm -hmm. um, I think everyone should be on the same time frame in the interest of equity. And I don't know if that's negotiable or how we work that, but that's a high priority for me. The statute wouldn't allow the board to do that for principals because it's in statute that principals who have sat in their position for two years need to have a, need to have a contract renewed to them by, or, or non-renewed by February 1st. Are principals the only people in that group? Yes. Okay. All right, then uh, I need to think about that more. <laughs> There's not much the board could do there, is what I'm saying, for that particular position. The board could negotiate with our other administrators. The, the hiring time frame for administrators is very different than teachers. So we have, we have a phenomenal leadership team that I like to keep the people in the position. We have a phenomenal team. I hear what you're saying, that that doesn't line up with budget. I hear that, that, that most definitely. So you could try to negotiate a clause into that contract. Yeah. around budget passage or something like that. That's something the board could try. It's negotiable though. Also, as a, as a you know, so I'm on my seventh or eighth month, um, something like that. But as I learn more about the, how the district operates, um, you know, I would like to be able to understand better which cuts when we do have to talk about cuts impact learning the most. Um, you know, we learned at our September 30th meeting way before all of this that um, district staff um, had increased by 61% in the past um, five years. That's not an accurate. I don't know where that number comes from. It's on, on the bottom of the presentation from that day. Um, but well, my point is that, um, you know, and at that, at that time. Oh, sorry. That's not administrative staff alone. Right. That would be all of the district, including teachers, IAs. Right, which was which was necessitating the need for more space. That's the yeah. way it was framed. Yeah, to us. yeah. I um, see what you're saying now. I yeah. thought you were just talking about administrators increasing yeah. by sixty one percent. That's not an accurate statement. So you know, I'm very hesitant to cut any teachers, um, but Vermont, you know, has by far the lowest staff to student ratio in the state. So if we do need to cut again, I'd like to learn more about the possibilities and have more control over it. And in the past couple of weeks, all I've really felt like I had control over is Roxbury, yes or no. And I'd like to learn more about the district and, and have more input on, on how we configure our staff. Mm -hmm. And class size might be another thing we might wanna revisit. State might do that for us. State might do that for us. We might want to get out ahead of that, though. We, we don't like it what the state does. For <laughs> this us. is true. This is true. The state generally makes good decisions. Yes. I just want to say I agree with Jake. No one wants to hear from me anymore. But I agree. Um, that felt really unfair and arbitrary. And so when we are looking at literally individuals, it felt like the timing, which I realized was out of our control. I think I would. I agree that I would really want to know all of the things i mean i keep thinking about like the windows at the middle school that i drive by every day and they look terrible and i know eventually they're going to get replaced um so there are other places that we really didn't have time to go into but i feel like that timeline felt really unfair when we're talking about individuals and their jobs that there was like a group of folks who are also incredibly valuable just because of timing weren't part of that equation i agree Further discussion? Let's do Scott. No, I was going to call a question. Uh, um, I don't think this is going to be as split as the last vote, but let's do roll anyways, because it's a big one. Uh, Jake? When, when to, should I restate the motion? Yeah. Um, I move that we warn a budget of $30,575,415 for FY25 for a district. 
second that? Nope. Let's second it. No, 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 you can tell I already oh. second. Oh, you did. I didn't even hear that. Sorry. Um, I'll vote yes. Right. Yes. 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 Kristen? Yes. We have the second budget. We cannot officially tell people to vote for it, but I will say that um, I, I really feel that that this board has stepped up and done a lot of hard work to respond to a very difficult situation. Um, our, our district needs stability to educate our kids. Um, and I ask everybody to go to the polls and do what they feel is best for our town and our kids and our community. Uh, yeah. uh, it's before we move on to monitoring reports. Um, <laughs> we're going to talk about the committee charge. Okay. Too, and then we can... um, I well, I also was curious whether or not the possi this possibility has been discussed at the level of how to support students right now who are going to RVS, Libby. Whether those conversations. And we, I'm wondering, I don't know how it's going to, I don't know if they're going to need extra supports around for the rest of the week, or I don't know if that's a possibility or if that's too detailed. I don't want to be too deep. I don't want to be micromanaging or anything. I'm just really holding what um, is going to be a lot of fear and um, thus far, what has happened, just Murray has written scripts for RVS teachers that they've used this week and last. Um, we have a partnership with Up for Learning that works with Student Voice, and last year did a fantastic job with the transition for our fourth graders. That planning process for fourth graders have just started, and we are we're planning on increasing their, their capacity to work with all of our kids for transitions. Um, and that's as far as we've gotten right now. Do you have any advice for what I should say to my children? Um, <laughs> you know your children's best friend. So I would, what I would say to my children is you have the opportunity to meet even more people who are going to love you. That's what I would say to my kids. How lucky are you? Be if you're not freaked out, your kids won't be freaked out. And the more upset the parents are, the more that's going to transfer to the kids, and they're going to have more fear about it. So I think just make it a normalized step that's going to happen next year. And so I want to I want to voice a commitment uh, that I hope that the board shares that our we have a responsibility to not just the students, but to the parents and to everyone that's going to be dramatically affected by this transition. I hope that the board shares in that commitment. What, what support we can offer to parents, I'm not sure, but if we can, I am determined to do anything that we can. I think this is a perfect segue yeah. into the conversation that I started to start um, and um, so our our committee charge from whenever that was, yeah. it seems like ages, uh, make a recommendation to the board by September 18th, 2024. Um, I, I think the timeline needs to be cut at least in half. Um, whether to continue to educate elementary age students at RVS, that, that decision has already been made. And so... I think at the time I was one of the ones advocating that it should be whether to and not how to. And so now I've got to correct my misstatement and go back to it being um, how to, um, what transition, I don't know what the wording is, um, but but I think we need, we need some work around the how. Um, and then I want to jump down to the committee makeup um, I had a long conversation with um, Miriam uh, and 
she disagreed with my rationale for why I didn't think students should be on the committee. Um, I actually think now, because the board made the decision that it did, um, that having students and teachers on the committee um, makes more sense. And I also wonder whether or not, I, I, I wonder if the board makeup makes sense or not. Do we need? I think we need, community, I think we need people who know. I, I think we need a lot of people from Roxbury to be able to say what the needs are. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we need some people with expertise about how to how to do this. I might not say how to educate because that seems to be talking okay. about what we yeah. actually do in the classroom. I would say how to transition, support the transition. I'm just using cross outs so we don't lose anything. But uh, once the board decides, I'll take those out. And Libby, I saw you you shot nodding your head when I was talking about the committee makeup. Um, and so I, I it sounds like yeah. the concern that you had from about teachers yeah. is no longer a concern right. as well. Okay, cool. Yeah, or Thank students. You. Yeah. And I think it, yeah. Um, Do you want them to make a recommendation or do you want them to like inform a successful, to facilitate an informed and successful process? Make recommendations. Yeah, make recommendations during uh, I and. Think you need a new sentence. Um, what you just said. Uh, this what committee will inform and, what did you say? Not make recommendations. Facilitate. 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 Thank you. Facilitate um, process to students. And should we maybe say it will meet? bi-weekly and make recommendations on a rolling basis. And I think, you know, maybe stuff should be coming out before she's the template. Yes. Honestly, well, I was just going to say like a like rolling basis. Yeah. question is valid, right? How do you prepare your kids for a big transition? I almost I, feel like I, I, eliminating the date entirely yeah. and having it as at least an ad hoc committee. Yeah. Well, that's why I said we have to have to meet like every two weeks and make recommendations yeah. on a rolling basis. So they're well, you could say they will make any recommendation um, for decisions that need to be made by the school board. For instance, that opens up yeah. funds for yeah. or, or uh, using fund balance or something like that. It could also, I don't know what else the board would need to decide, but because I haven't thought that. I agree. Well. I, I think it needs to be captured in the charge in uh, in terms of this committee's role um, with with fund balance. You know, identifying you know strategies for transition that may require um, fund balance. You know, uh, to the extent it makes sense for this group to be coming up with um, specific dollar amount requests from the fund balance. But I want to make sure that it's very clear. I think we've all signaled here tonight that there very much could be a monetary um, impact that could allow for some really supportive transition plans. I don't think we want to be outrageous here, but things that just really ensure a high integrity and supportive transition and that this committee um, will make recommendations in terms of um, access to the, uh, to the fund balance. Um, and I think just in terms of timeline, I agree, it makes, obviously it makes sense to scrap the September date, but I do want to um, emphasize um, kind of pace and expedience around um, busing and after school. This doesn't necessarily, you know, need to go into the charge, but um, I think those two pieces are incredibly important for Roxbury families to have a very clear understanding of to the to the extent that we can work as hard as we possibly can to make sure that there is clarity around busing and after school before the end of the school year. 
I realize that that is a tight timeline, but I think that at the end of the school year, families evaporate, our lines of communication are more difficult to, um, to track down. And I think that these are two of the biggest, most fundamental pieces that are really shaking Roxbury families right now in terms of this um, transition. So I would wanna make sure that this committee knows that we need to move immediately, quickly, and specifically, I think, focus on the transportation and after school piece. Yeah, no, I I agree with that. And I think the end of the school year is a great target date to have those pieces worked out. Cause I think you're right, Chris, it's gonna be hard to do over it's gonna be hard to do over the summer. And I also think it's gonna be good for families to have those answers for themselves and their kids by the end of the school year. So they have a little more certainty about going going into next year. Yes. <clears throat> I, I don't think they want a letter on August 20th telling them that. <clears throat> Absolutely not. And that would be unacceptable yeah. also. Yep. Jim, I think I, I think I heard you mention something along the lines of a biweekly meeting schedule. Um, would that then afford the committee to at least make periodic reports back to the board at our meetings since we also meet bi-weekly? I don't know if, I mean, I would imagine in the beginning it might be a little bit slow, but those recommendations as we move into May and June might start coming more frequently. The board has committed. six more board meetings in this year. Yeah, and that leads to sort of about six or seven meetings of that committee. I would, I would, I would think so, especially if there's a, especially. I mean, I think we should probably put at least a board member on that committee as a liaison. Um, I mean, right now we have four. I don't think we need yeah. four. Uh, I think we should probably have a board member or two on that committee to. <laughs> and other other committees report back. Yeah after each meeting yeah. so it would be the, okay cool thank you and i think we just have hey, I have item on the on our agenda yeah. until yeah the transition is well underway or well taken care of yeah um uh, sorry some things will happen this spring like mm -hmm. kids visiting and right. stuff yeah. like that right yeah, right. yeah. okay Is it okay for me to speak? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just can't see what's going on in the room. Um, I have lost track of the charge a little bit, but did we retain um, deliberating the future role of the RVS building in the MRPS district? Because I think what we've done tonight, right, is we have initiated a transition of RVS students to UES, um, but a, a quote, closure of the school or, you know, MRPS no longer having an educational purpose for the building is really kind of the piece that's referenced in the Act 46 agreement that also requires a board vote. And then, you know, there are clearly uh, negotiations with the town. And I, I know that that is going to be weighing heavily on people's minds um, tonight, <laughs> starting tonight. Um, and so is that piece included here? Just did, Kristen. Yeah, thank you. Is that, that last sentence in the- Okay. Okay, thank you. I will say, I think that conversation will take longer. Yep. So yes. I don't wanna give the committee a short deadline for their whole charge if we're also asking them to, tasking, tasking the committee with the future use of the building, so. Um, anyway, I can't remember. Did we actually, we, we did end of the school year for a couple of, of these key questions, mm -hmm. but not, yeah, anyway. Yeah, I mean, so I, as I see it now, there is no deadline. So this is an ad hoc committee that we've, we're, we're creating. And so the, the, the charge, right, includes the sort of more short-term needs of the families and also includes the medium to long-term concerns about things like after-school programming, summer potentially, future use of the building. So it's, it's both. 
with no finite deadline. It might be that the board can also revise this charge. Yeah. Yes. Committee could revise this charge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are we good with the revised charge? Would you like to hear it read out loud? Yeah, why don't you read it out loud? This committee will inform and facilitate the transition process to move students from RVS to UES starting the 2024-2025 school year. They will make any recommendation to the board regarding strategies that may need fund balance money or board decision. The committee will design and implement a process to engage the communities in both Roxbury and Montpelier. The committee will use the MRPS stated priorities as a guide and base its recommendations on the following factors, educational, including academics and safety, belonging and wellness considerations, financial considerations and staffing considerations. Particularly str particular strategies that will be considered by the committee include, but not limited to transportation, after school programming and future use of the building. Do you want like grammar or syntax and stuff like that? <laughs> no, Anna will do that. Okay. <laughs> At 10 o'clock, no, I, I don't. <laughs> so glad you worked do we syntax put, into our board. Um, do we want to have two board members, Kristen and I, and it says two to three community members from both Montpelier and Roxbury. Um, do you want to do two from Montpelier and four from Roxbury? And maybe two students from each from Roxbury and two students from Montpelier, not necessarily any particular school, but something like that, if they're willing to join us. I honestly think the students, I think it's imperative that we get some, old, some older students from Roxbury. Yeah, that's, that's, what, that's, what, I'm, that's, that's what, what I think is most imperative, kids who have done the transition here. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, yeah, I absolutely agree with that. So should there be more than two kids? I do That's think it would be helpful think. to have two kids from Montpelier. Mm -hmm. And should I we think, have more than two? I think we should ask our, what who they are think. not here right now. <laughs> I would nominate our school, student school board members. As they should be. <laughs> I mean, I, I think we say two to four. And that way it gives us- From, each, from each, town, each, town, each town, kind of? Yeah. Something like that. It, I will tell you quite honestly that our students are so yeah. busy in the spring that it's it it will be very hard to get four students who can yeah. who can from attend one. regularly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from any from either place. Like it's just the reality of having committees in the spring. Um, yeah, I'm I'm uh, somewhat confident in the Roxbury folks who have had to deal with that. Yeah, and which I, what I'm more. That's more the voice that I think we need to most definitely hear. I'd be interested still in being on that committee. Can you speak about it? I would still be interested in being on that committee. And I, I really support having a Montpelier board rep on the committee and not just having Kristen and Rhett carry that for yeah. the board. Yeah, no, no, I'd be happy Thank to you. continue Thank serving you. on it as well. Um, but also, I don't know. I think Lynn and and if Kristen or Rhett want to do that, I don't I don't think they need to carry it, but I do think that they have a different connection to the Roxbury community than the Montpelier voters or the Montpelier board members do. Sure. I'm pretty sure we both want to do it. Right, so Kristen? I say if both of you want to do it, then let's put both of you on it. Yeah. Although that creates a quorum. Do we do we care? Well, it's a they're one meeting. They're one meeting. Yeah, we can't. Yeah, it's it's a committee of okay. the board. So, yeah. I just I have a question. I, um, I. I could see us certainly wanting to tap into the wisdom of teachers um, and as well as potentially other administrators. I don't know that they need to serve on the board, but I guess I would ask Libby, or sorry, on the committee, but I would ask Libby, you know, could you serve as a liaison and kind of helping us to navigate like, okay, who could we tap into within the district staff that could help like, you know, Jess Murray's skill set, Nick Connor's skill set, um, and just how we could 
you know, the, the committee could could tap into them. Of course. Yeah. Great. Hey, you, we could put um, advising capacity from MRPS staff. Great. As needed. Sorry, grammar is a bit. <laughs> Any clarification? We're talking about first and fourth grade students being on this committee to help decide the future of the Roxbury building. Who are the students from Roxbury? High school kids who are yeah, here, middle and high school kids. Yeah. Okay. And, and I do think they're there is value in, and we had it in the old charge, but um, the advisor, I can't remember the wording, but but we, we may find that there's value in speaking with yeah. those students and not having them on the committee. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and they're open to it, so yes. anyone can yeah. come. And, and, and part of what these committees have done in the past is organize um, sort of community uh, forums. a forum which would engage the kids in the elementary school just they wouldn't be part of the committee but that's a big part of what we would be doing i think along with the district support for the kids this for right now i think we're good for this right now i i I think we should definitely do a ton of quick outreach and get those people yeah. lined up. Hannah has flyers ready already. I want to acknowledge the current staff at RVS who have communicated their love for that school and their commitment to the community and to those kids and who have really come together, I think, over the last few years with Libby and others' leadership um, all reports suggest that that flywheel that's happening in the district district was really, really churning at RVS. And I just want to acknowledge all of that hard work and I want to appreciate you all and, you know, encourage you to, um, I don't know, just to, to finish the year strong. I don't know. Shannon will not let them do anything else. Yeah, and thank you for acknowledging that, Brett. I know this is, this is tough. Um, and the, the work that's been done, and it is being done at that school, that the staff is incredible. And it's not. Yeah, this this was this was a hard decision we did not want to make and it was not any indication of of the education that's occurring there or the the wonderful folks that are are doing fantastic work there i, I know that that uh staff right now is really really strong and really excellent policy monitoring policy, policy monitoring I move we approve the policy monitoring reports for policies C28 and D5. C28 being transgender and gender nonconforming students, and D5 being animal dis dissection. Do you have a second? I'll second. Those. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Um, Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Well, thank you, everyone. It's a uh, somber night, but I, I'm really proud of the work that's been put in. And I know that all of you have, uh, have earned, earned your $1,000.